yeah, that shows me a second connection into the. Uh, I think that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Good. Excellent. And if I'm not mistaken, it was 30 minutes in total, right? With questions or without questions? Uh, with questions. With questions. Okay. Awesome. But is it 30 minutes? Let me make sure. Yes, 30 minutes with questions. Okay, so I'll try to do 25 ish. my timer here. Oh, Andrea, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. I just uh, right now to introduce you to the audience. <laughs> yeah, you can, of you course. can start directly at you. Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. Welcome back from Long Break. And so I hope you are all excited for our afternoon session. And our first speaker is Dr. Andrea Tagliasati. And Andrea mm -hmm. is a senior research scientist in the Google Brain and Toronto office, headed by Jeffrey Hinton where he leads the inverse graphics research pillar. And by now today, just let's welcome Andrea to give a talk on the structure representation for 3D computer vision. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me well? Yeah, very yeah. clear. Good. So I kind of took uh, inspiration a little bit from uh, uh, the, the workshop organization page, and I found actually this piece of text uh, that contains like three keywords over which I will kind of use to structure my talk today. Uh, so the first part is parsing, uh, because to have 3 d understanding, of course, you have one through parsing. And we're going to look actually at, at the parsing technology that allows, or, or a technique that allows you to actually parse a scene via a progressive refinement of hypothesis. We also care a lot about reconstruction in 3 d understanding. And here I'm going to focus on, in particular, on the reconstruction of digital humans and a new representation. Uh, for that type of task. And the third part uh, is something actually that until uh, I think this year, nobody's really touched, which is creating representations that are not just uh, um, created for their own good, but they're able to actually interact with other technology that we already have in, in the graphics and, and robotics community. So I'm gonna try to break it down into three phases and I'm gonna start of course with the parsing part. And I'm gonna present ACNE, which is actually gonna be presented here at, uh, at this CVPR. So what is ACNE? Um, so ACNE targets uh, permutation of covariant learning. So what does that mean? Um, I give you an example here. It means that you have a set P, which means that it's an order set. And in output of the network, you're gonna create a set of the same size in such a way that if I change the order of the first two entries, then the order of the, of the two outputs should change accordingly, right? So they're paired inputs and outputs. And why this is important? Well, you can take a lot of problems in computer vision and you can write them, for example, in, uh, in least square form, right? 
where you have some, some function that depends on your input data, which is this point P, uh, you're optimizing for a, for a quantity mu, and uh, you want to perform some form of robust optimization, so you're going to um, use some weights WN to perform this operation. Okay, and why this is important? Well, because if you have a solution for the quantity mu that the optimization problem uh, should produce, then what you can do is that you can supervise the quantity with respect to some grand truth measurements and you can backdrop the entire architecture in that way. Which means that for permutation equivariant learning, what we actually care about is some network that is able to generate a new quantity attached to a particular entry in this set P. Okay, where this kind of uh, uh, problem is actually important, well, there is actually an entire family of techniques that rely on, uh, on, this, uh, on this kind of structure. For example, if you look at feature normalization is one of them. Uh, I will go into more details in, in a couple of slides. Uh, if you want to do like some form of like parametric fitting of some geometric model, lines, planes, uh, whatever really you want to, to some ground truth data that also falls in the same category. Or uh, most importantly, stereo matching, right? Where you want to determine these weights WN in such a way that when you have a collection of points, which in, their, in this case are actually correspondences, you actually compute uh, the camera calibration uh, for the extrinsic parameter that, that actually corresponds to your, uh, to your different in view in between the two images. So I'm gonna actually st gonna start from something even more basic to explain the core idea, which is actually uh, IRLS. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna start from uh, a, a, a super simple, probably the simplest least score problem you can imagine, which is the problem of computing the centroid of a set of points, right? The, the average, which is what you use in a, in a feature normalization layer. So you know that you can actually write uh, an arithmetic mean in least square form, right? It's actually the equation that I'm showing you here on screen. Uh, the quantity mu is nothing else than the arithmetic mean at the point Pn. But what happens if your points Pn look actually like the ones that you see on the right, where you have a lot of outliers? Well, you know from your optimization course, uh, I guess, uh, that the solution that you're gonna get, in this case, for example, is this red dot. And this is really not, uh, does not express the structure of the data because you can see in these uh, in this point set that I on the right, I actually have three clusters, and if I put the red point in each in any of the three clusters, I, th I think it would have been a good uh, a much better idea of, compared to where the red point was placed. So the fact is that if you actually use uh, tricks from robust optimization from traditional optimization non neural networks, what you can do is that you can remove the least square form of this problem and you can actually convert. Uh, the, the L2 norm into robust kernels. So these are called uh, M estimators in statistics if you're interested. But the idea is that K is not anymore the square function and it typically is connected to the distribution of residuals uh, in your, um, in your um, probabilistic model of, of your problem, okay? And the idea is that as soon as you do this, there is actually certain class of functions K that allow you to convert this problem back to a least square problem, right? So what we can do is that we can take this problem that actually is now non-convex and non-linear because it's this function K, but we can convert it back in a least square form. So if you see the equation at the bottom is identical to the equation in the first line, there's two differences. The first is that there is now a, a weight in front of every point. And as you can see, there is a one-to-one -one mapping in between the end point and then weight. And the second part is that the structure of the optimization problem is actually iterative, right? You don't give a single solution because the problem is convex, but this solution depends on initialization. And I'm gonna use the video that you have on the right to actually show this. So what I'm doing here, and the code is actually the link that you see at the bottom of the, of the, of the GIF, um, is actually uh, the third equation that you see in this slide, where I picked a random starting point for the quantity mu, so mu zero, and I let the solver basically converge to the centroid that it was uh, able to determine, right? So what does this mean? It's like, well, this actually happens quite a lot because now you can think of these points. These are not points for which you want to compute a mean, but these are actually features from a set of features that a neural network produced. And what you want to do in here is that after these blue trajectories converged, you want to normalize your features so they're nice and compact around the origin, right? So that's the kind of like core idea of the system. But let's take, take a step back a second. Remember that this equation has this iterative structure. So let's see what, uh, what happens. So we're gonna go back to our um, pictorial representation of the network. We have a bunch of points, you produce a bunch of weights. And this is actually the, the ACNI network, as we call it. And we now relate it to the, this iteratively really, really square recipe that I, that I just mentioned, which has this concept of time and what we can do, or iterations more than time. And what we can do is that we can unroll these iterations, right? So now, for example, iteration number zero will be the value of the features at that particular intermediate state uh, of the network. Uh, 
time number one will be at that stage and time number two will be at that stage and so on. And if you see, like the only thing that we have for now is, is, a, um, is a small MLP, so a fully connected layer in input. And this MLP actually only acts on a single point at a time, right? So it's not correlating points with each other. It's performing a per point operation, kind of like a la point net, uh, if you want to think it that way. And what happens in this case, like if the function f that I'm showing you right here has these characteristics, then as far as the blocks, the ARB blocks satisfy the same characteristics, then we have a guarantee that the, the, net, the resulting network will be equivariant, right? And as you can see here, we already have this structure of unrolled uh, IRLS loop that I was mentioning. Earlier. So now let's zoom in a little bit more. Let's uh, open up the ARB block to see what happens. So what happens is that we have two more, um, you know, simple MLP acting on one point at a time, which means that again, everything is permutation equivariant. And we have a skip connection on our net. Again, nothing special, everything remain equivariant. And the only complexity, therefore, could be introduced by this ACM block. So again, we're going to open up that block, and I promise there is no more recursion involved. We open up the block, and this is the internal structure. And it's actually, the diagram looks more complicated than what it is, because the only thing that happens within this block is this operation. You take a feature f, which belongs to a set, an unsorted set of features. And what you do is that you remove the mean mu of the set f, but this mean mu is actually computed in a robust way, which means that before I compute the mean, rather than taking the entire mean mu, I am going to uh, take a weighted average, right? And rather than compute the, the variance sigma in a kind of considering every feature f as being 100% part of my data set, I'm going to let the network decide which features I'm going to respect, I'm going to normalize with respect to. And what you're seeing here on the left is actually that mechanism. So we have two ways of computing attention, right? Because these uh, weights Ws are actually a form of attention. We have a global way of computing attention, which means that uh, feature points can actually interact with each other. And this is actually achieved by a softmax that preserves equivariance yet again. And the other one is a local attention, which is the second branch over here, which is nothing else than yet another MLP. There's MLPs everywhere in my papers, by the way, just uh, FYI. And this dot operation over here is nothing else than a pointwise product, right? Which means that this module receives some features, computes in this branch right here, uh, the normalization weights, and it does uh, a, a, normaliz a weighted normalization in this block. And this is just a standard group normalization from, uh, from Kaimin's paper seen in the past. So now what we have is like, we have two different parts of the network that are actually inspired by RLS, right? The first one is the structure, which is this unrolled iteration part. And the second part is actually this way of computing features and normalization of features, which need to take into account of the fact that features might have outliers, right? Because it's, it makes complete sense that some features should have outliers. It's like you have a big network that is expected to do everything. So some of them might be garbage and some of, some of the features might actually be useful. So now, uh, what happens uh, if we perform this? Um, we actually can throw this in a number of applications. And I actually kind of like this reviewer number two comment from our CVPR submission. The paper is too general. You should actually submit it to an ML conference. Thankfully, this is not one of the negative reviewers, but I think it's just funny to, to, to mention a, a criticism in, in this form. And, and the reason for which I think it's funny is because the reason for which uh, he had this comment is because we actually showed a bunch of different applications. As promised uh, in the first slide, we actually applied this to robust line feeding. So you can think of this as being some form of like relaxed transact operation, right? Where the deeper you go within the network, as you can see, the attention that certain points will receive uh, will be updated. And in the end, the layer 20, basically the attention was one for all points that lie close to the line and zero for all of the other points, right? So this can be thought of being some form of like ransack operation where you don't have to rely on, on random sampling. Uh, we also tried to, to perform uh, some classical uh, shape net classification. Uh, with the only difference is that we actually polluted our point set with outliers, uh, with a ratio of outliers to non-outliers that you can see right here. And if you actually notice at uh, the classification performance, it collapsed much more significantly in networks that cannot take an account of, uh, of uh, or does not take an account of this robust optimization versus what we are able to do. And finally, uh, the most important uh, baseline is actually what we run on wide baseline stereo, over which actually we, we currently have the state of the art. And you can kind of see what the network is doing right here. You have a set of putative correspondences, and the network was able to decide amongst which, which of these correspondences, which ones are the useful ones. But they didn't do that in a single step. It was not a single forward pass that told you which ones were the important correspondences. It started from an hypothesis and then refined the hypothesis down to the correct solution, just in the way in which a, a robust optimization tackles the problem as well. 
Um, okay, so just a summary of what I just showed you. And by the way, the code is already available at acne.github.io. Uh, we are inspired by iteratively related least squares, so traditional uh, robust optimization techniques. We introduce uh, an attention model for point cloud, which is a uh, permutation equivariant by design. Uh, I just show you a very, very simple normalization layer that has given us three to 7% gain in performance, more or less across the entire board of application that, that we tried it on. And it also achieves state-of-the-art performance in wide baseline stereo. And a note on this, actually, if you open up uh, very recent versions of wide baseline stereo network, they seem to actually already have uh, adopted our, our technique therein. And something else, just a teaser of something that we're working on right now, if you now don't take attention as being a single-headed attention, which means that you only have a scalar uh, weight per point, but you transform it into a, a multi-class attention, you can actually achieve state-of-the-art in terms of uh, structural parsing and reconstruction. So if you know Atlas Navi 2, basically gives you a, a much better way of realizing those type of mechanisms. So this is the first uh, uh, part of the paper based, or the, of the talk, sorry, uh, that uh, involved parsing the world. Uh, we're now going to move on to uh, representations of, of deformable geometry, right? Because uh, in the previous part of the talk, everything was rigid because it was just seen uh, and there's a static um, uh, connotation to the entire type of data. Now we're going to actually look at things that move in, in time. And what I want to bring your attention to is how we're actually doing this right now for digital humans. So this is a, like a, a pictorial representation of what the simple model from uh, the MPI group in Tübingen looks like. Uh, you have a rig on the left, uh, which is uh, designed by an artist. You have uh, a triangular mesh uh, that is beautifully designed by an artist. And then you have skinning waves that are painted, painted by a professional artist again. And realizing a high quality rig is not something that even the, the average human can do, right? You need like an expert to perform this really well. And this is a very non-to-end pipeline, not end-to-end -end pipeline, right? And what is more than this is that, okay, these are meshes and now to be able to use them in, in many type of tasks. For example, I want to know, am I hitting this object, right? Am I hitting a human if I perform a certain operation? Well, now to perform those kind of uh, answers, you actually have to also rely on custom acceleration data structures that again are custom made and typically not differentiable. So for example, here is an AABB3, which is the axis align bound in box three to convert the triangular mesh that you see in the middle into something, for example, like an occupancy or, or a sign distance function of, uh, of the human. So this is pretty bad, right? Because it means that, you know, we, we are trying to solve problems in terms of perception for humans, and we claim to be completely end-to-end, -end, but then we have this massive over-engineered, well, not over-engineered, rightfully, rightfully engineered uh, pipeline for digital humans, right? So what can we do to actually move away from this? Well, what we can do is actually, it's uh, what we did in, in NASA. So uh, now if you look at this different pipeline, uh, it, it's actually quite clean, because now the pose representation doesn't rely on a rig anymore. Because uh, this parameter theta now it's literally just a collection, so a set of uh, coordinate frames in space, so as raw as you can go. Uh, the network in the middle is just a collection of MLPs, as we will see in a second, and this collection of MLPs directly generates an occupancy function for the object that you see on the right. Right, so there's no more conversion step because the network has already learned to represent that function directly. So how can you do this? Well, um, you can think of it these ways: like if I want to query uh, the data on the right, somewhere in space, for example, where my mouse pointer is, what I want is that I want a network O. So when I use omega, it's always a neural network, by the way. So I have a network O that given the point X, like my mouse position in input, and a description of the pose, which in this case is the rest pose, it tells me what is the value of the occupancy at that point X for that pose theta, right? And if you want to do this, this is nothing else than a simple generalization of things like occupancy networks, deep SDFs, and the NIM net. Right, so all of these networks basically perform exactly this operation, with the exception that here uh, we are proposing a, a way of parameterizing pose in a way that doesn't require an artist to be involved. Right, and we'll see in a second why, how these models perform in, in evaluation. The second thing that you can do is that you can take an excellent uh, variations of this model, and what you can do is that rather than having a single uh, MLP function that give you the occupancy or position in space, you can have a collection of uppercase B of them. Right, so you have B elements. Uh, and each of them is an MLP. Each of these MLP is associated with one of the particular uh, coordinate frames that you have in input. And this generates basically the composition of the human body, which is you see at the bottom. And the union of them will give you the model that we had earlier, right? So you put them together via max operation in the indicator function space. So this is uh, okay, but we can do actually a lot better than that. Because now what we can do is that we can take the same structure. And what we want to do is that we want to achieve the same level of flexibility 
that deformable models, for example, for face or body tracking were able to achieve. Which means that, for example, when we move as humans and we flex, for example, our biceps, we are not just a collection of rigid elements, which is exactly what this model would, un would, uh, would use, right? What we want is that, for example, when we flex our bicep, we want the geometry of our bicep to change conditional on the pose. And to achieve that, what we can do is that we can take our pose parameters, oops, we can taste our pose parameters, and we can actually have this projection, uh, little, these are linear layers, so there is no machine learning here, this is just matrices, uh, that provide a hint to these MLPs on how the geometry of the component changes conditional on the pose. And I think actually these, uh, these dimensionality reduction layers is essential, but uh, I refer you to the paper for, for an ablation on that. But let's move on. So now we have three recipes, right? We have the, uh, I'm gonna use like OCNET and DeepSDF to do everything, or I'm gonna use a bunch of them, a collection of them, and I'm gonna use the region model, or I'm gonna use a bunch of them, and each of them is allowed to change their geometry according to the formation. So this is actually, uh, let's say, the reconstruction task on the massive AMAS uh, data set. On the top row, you see the grand truth. Uh, we evaluate against the defaust, the defaust subset and the transition subset. And you can actually, here I'm only gonna show you the uh, unstructured model, which is the OCNET model, let's put it that way, versus the deformable model at the bottom. And as you can see, basically, when the poses are relatively similar to the one that uh, you have in the training set, the model performs okay-ish. But as soon as you go into pauses that, that are difficult to generalize, then the model basically completely collapsed. And this doesn't matter how much data you pump through because the transition data set actually contains a large variety, I think it's 110 motion sequences for the same person. So these models are actually failing with an enormous amount of, of data being provided to the model, right? And, and over here on the right, what you can see is actually how much uh, that is the case. So the top uh, table shows you how the model uh, generalizes across individuals, which is basically the left half of the figure, as you can see, is not the same person. While the right hand side of the figure, it shows you the bottom uh, table, it shows you how does it perform across a wide variety of sequences. And if you look at the OpNet, DeepSDF, and IMNet models, is what I call you here, the change in reconstruction performance is drastic. It's close to 50%, right? What is it, 45% roughly? Yeah. 45% in, in, uh, in IOU, 70% uh, in F-score, and three, four order magnitudes in chamfer L1. So what is my hypothesis for which actually uh, this is the case? Well, first, um, basically we gave a way of the network of memorizing much better in a, in a canonical coordinate frame, what is the appearance of objects, and then we gave it a cheap way of representing the formations. But I think this is really interesting because the result of these papers uh, PFU, as well as, uh, as many others that have been trying to use NERF, that have been trying to use implicit functions to represent graphics like quantities. And what I've showed you here today is basically that unless you encode this change of coordinate frames directly within the network, the performance of the model collapses, right? Because there's very, there's a very little difference in between this model where everything is done by an MLP and this model, oops, and this model where I'm still using the same MLP except much, much smaller in terms of neurons, but I'm also performing a change of transformation or a change of coordinate frame in input to each branch. So I hope to, I've convinced you that if you want to now represent uh, digital humans, uh, you might want to actually give a try to this different way of representing uh, your knowledge because you might get a drastic change in, in performance. And finally, like we didn't stop at this stage. It's like I wanted to say, or we wanted to find a way, a new way of representing information, but not just purely from a reconstruction from a task, but we wanted to say, okay, if these are things that we should be able to use in let's say dense registration pipelines, is this usable? And I'm gonna only give you a two line hint of how this works, but this is actually the optimization problem uh, that you solve in registration. You're optimizing for the transformation theta right now. And by the way, this is not machine learning anymore, right? We we learned the model in the previous slide. So now we have this human represented as a neural network. And now what we want to do is that we want to deform the human to fit some data that you see on the left, right? So we want to find the parameter theta in such a way that if I put this yellow model in the blue point cloud, they closely match. And the green guy is just ground truth. And what we show you, what we drive in the paper is that you can actually take these, uh, these optimization in the top right and with a couple of steps, by the way, phi is just a sign distance function, but with a couple of steps, you can actually convert it into the expression that you see at the bottom. And if you actually look at it, this is trivial to implement, right? So if you want to realize that the form of a ICP algorithm, this is now completely trivial to implement because the only thing you're gonna do is that you're gonna evaluate the, the neural network O somewhere in space. And this is 
trivial. It's just uh, you put a point in the network and you evaluate it, nothing else. And the only other thing that you need is that you need to take one of the blue points in the point cloud and perturb them with a Gaussian, and then you're done. Which means that now, you know, if you want to do a deformable ICP kind of pipeline, and I was actually, uh, I worked in this area a lot, and, and it took me like six months to a year to put together this pipeline. Now this pipeline is, is about 10 lines of code, which is a, a pretty drastic change. And here, what I'm showing you right now is I think for the first time that, that a, a digital representation in, in terms of a neural network of a digital human is actually being used to track an actual point cloud in input. Remember, this is not machine learning. I'm using a pre-trained model, which is the moving yellow guy, to track the blue point cloud. And there was not a single closest point uh, operation involved in this optimization, right? Everything was just forward pass through networks, and that's it. And you can see how it performs in, in these cases, which I think is, is, pretty, is pretty interesting. So just a, a, a summary, right? So we, we basically tried to rewrite from scratch the digital human representations in an end-to-end -end way. Uh, we basically provided a generalization of blind shapes from models like simple uh, from a neural point of view. We introduced a new way of representing pose, which doesn't require an artist. Uh, we have now a deformable ICP in 10 lines of TensorFlow code. And the currently clear limitation is that we only focus on a single human, but you're more than welcome to, to start working on the multi-human version. I don't think there will be any really problem in generalizing these across, uh, across individuals. So this is the second part of the talk where I talked about uh, reconstruction, and then I'm gonna move on uh, to the third one, uh, where I'm gonna want to talk about interaction. Right? So this is ConvexNet uh, done with, uh, with my colleagues at, uh, at Google in Toronto. And, uh, and I start with the question, what is the best 3D representation, right? So the question is, is not very clear to answer because you have explicit models like triangle mesh, suits, uh, point cloud, and patches, and so on which are actually great for inference because they produce something that your typical graphics engine uh, or your typical vision application can use directly, but they're actually a pain to train, right? So because, the, because of the structure or the very unstructured structure of triangle meshes specifically. And then the other uh, models, which is the, the, the deep SDF, OCNET and so on models that have been proposed uh, in the last uh, year or two uh, that actually look at an implicit version of the problem, which on the other hand are great for training because it's just a classification problem, but then at the inference time, you have to rely on things like marching cubes to compute the, the underlying mesh. And what we did is actually creating a hybrid in between these two models, right? We put the, the benefits of modern models and divide these hybrid models. And how do we do it? We do it via convexes. So why? Well, first of all, convexes are great. Uh, they are like at the very, very core of efficient rigid body simulations, for example, for robotics and computer graphics and so on, but they're also uh, universal approximators of geometry. So if I give you an, a large enough number of convexes, I can represent any piece of geometry to any degree of fidelity. And if you now actually look at Blender, Maya, Bullet, or whatever you want, if you actually look inside of the rigid body physics, this is the typical uh, thing you're gonna see. You're gonna see uh, these colliders, they're called, and uh, they become more and more complicated to evaluate and there is a gap in between convex hull, which is more or less the standard way of evaluating them, and the mesh, which is uh, the complete wild west. So once I dropped uh, about 10,000 little airplanes on a plane, attempting to use the mesh collider, and I obtained mesh popcorn. Actually, that's, what, uh, that's how it looked like. So I invite you to try in Blender and, and prove me wrong from that point of view. So now it, convexes are important. Well, convexes, first of all, uh, you can have a neural network that spits out a convex. So what you're seeing right here is a convex made of five elements. So what is this convex? Well, this is what it looks like. So each line in this tensor represents actually a hyperplane or a half space to be particular. And if I take the, diff the set difference of all of these half spaces, I'm left with the red region. And what is uh, more important here is that I can take now this set of, or this tensor of half spaces, and I can convert it into an implicit function, which is all of the advantages that I was showing you a couple of seconds ago for the other projects. And what does this expression look like? Uh, that's it. So basically you can see the expression on, on the screen and what the effect of the parameters in this expression is that they allow you, for example, to have a permutation invariance because the, the log sum x is one thing else in a form of softmax. They allow you to control the smoothness of the surface that is produced as well as the smoothness of the drop off at the boundary of the convex object. So this is great, which means that now we can do uh, machine learning with convex functions and train them uh, in an implicit way, which is gonna work much, much better than if we use like polygonal meshes. Uh, but what we can actually do is that we can use the point that I gave you earlier that meshes, sorry, the convexes 
are universal approximators in the set sense. So if you put many of them, I can approximate anything. And now I can have my encoder spit out a collection of convexes and a collection of transformations. And because these are implicit functions, I can use them as function and compose them as functions, right? So you took the union of a collection of five functions, for example, to build this, uh, this X character. And this entire pipeline becomes backpropagable. Uh, and again, this is nothing else than a max operation and the transformations basically change the coordinate frames of your, of your, of your system and these are shapes and locations. Which means that now I can take a 3D object because this generalizes without a single, uh, well, I guess one line of code, which is changing a vector three to a vector, sorry, vector two to a vector three. And now you can actually get convex decomposition of 3D objects in a fully differentiable way. So how do you train them? As I said, they're implicit functions. So you basically, you have some uh, loss that tell you that you want the occupancy to be close to some ground truth, or you can use differentiable rendering. There is no difference here. And uh, you can just sample uh, the predicted function that the network outputs. Uh, you measure the same function in the ground truth and you try to minimize the error, right? So very classical, plus some auxiliary losses to, to regularize the output. But now there's something else. It's like, I show you the implicit view of these models, but there is also an explicit interpretation. What I can do is that I can take my tensor of half spaces and I can now take a dual. I can take a duality transformation and maps lines to points and vice versa. And in the dual domain, these are the points will look like. I can take the convex hull of the dual points. I take a second duality transformation. I get these points back. And then I take a second convex hull operation. And through these four, three steps, what did I obtain? Well, now it means that I can take a network that takes an input, for example, the single image, outputs the convex net tensor representation, and now is able to actually generate directly a polygonal mesh without any need for running marching queue directly. Which means also that if you now you want to have a single view reconstruction that you can use, for example, for reinforcement learning, it means that these models can be injected directly in something like PyBullet and they just work because this is already a convex decomposition of geometry and it's completely compatible with any downstream application in computer graphics that you might have. Uh, there is another work that we, that we did uh, in parallel, but it can, it's a bit more general and a bit different from the point of view. But basically what we did is that rather than having a fixed structure of the tree, we're trying to learn the combinatorial structure of the compositional tree of convexes that you see right here. But I, there's gonna be the talk on Wednesday morning, Wednesday at noon, I guess, in Seattle time and later there. So this is a summary. We propose the uh, differentiable layer for convex L. It's a hybrid representation that kind of gives you the best of both worlds. It's simulation ready. So think about differentiable rendering and differential physics. And you actually get, got pretty great results in terms of actually not single view reconstruction, this is from depth maps. Apologies about that. Um, and it gives you this nice polygonal representation with, the, with none of the pain. So the topology of the problem is basically determined at runtime. So I'm, I'm done uh, with two minutes and 30 seconds left. These are the three topics that I covered. I show you some new techniques to parse a scene and a hint of what is coming up uh, from our lab. I propose you a new way of representing digital humans that is now completely end-to-end. -end. And I propose you a representation of, um, of 3D geometry, which is, uh, um, directly usable in machine learning, but also directly usable by any downstream application that want to use them without need of conversion. And I thank you for listening to me for half an hour and I welcome any questions now. Yeah, thank you, Andrea, really nice talk. Uh, so since we already have a few questions in the chat room, uh, maybe yep. just uh, pick the questions in the chat room and answer them. And if you guys um, have any questions, we can just discuss in Can the you read them also. or? So let me go in acne, you still need to, uh, you still need the batch to contain enough clean samples though, right? Uh, do you think of keeping a memory bank instead of handling higher noise? Uh, enough clean samples. I mean, of course, it's, it's kind of like Ransack, right? If, you're, if your instance doesn't contain enough samples that are correct, uh, it's gonna be difficult, but differently from Ransack, uh, Ransack will always give you an approximate solution, right? Because you never have points that are exactly on the surface. And usually there is a, a fine tuning on that. But in our case, because it's actually a regression problem, it's not, uh, it's not a, um, a randomized search problem. If we don't have exactly perfect sample, it actually still works. And that's actually why we have a comparison in the paper where if we use Ransack after acne, the result perform actually drops. And we tried our best to not make it drop, but we, we failed in, in doing that. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Um, oh, or okay, you can you can ask me or uh, more after. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Andrea.
<laughs> no worries. So second question, uh, there are multiple ways to get around correspondences such as optimizing on distance transforms. However, in many of those correspondences are rather implicit. Is that also the case here? Can we query some queer kind of on-demand correspondences? For which paper is this? The second one, right? The digital human one? That is correct. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we, so I had this conundrum about is the SDF the right quantity to map or is the occupancy? I'm actually pretty convinced that right now the right quantity to, to model within networks is occupancy because an SDF can always be computed if you have the occupancy in a quasi differentiable way. So what's the point of storing it within, a, within a, an MLP or in a network? You can, if that's the quantity that you want to, to map, but it has some nasty corner cases. So we actually were working on that and then converted it uh, for the case of digital human to something else. And this is a bit of a technical discussion here. So feel free to reach out to me and, and we can talk more. I give you my, my um, uh, Twitter handle. So it, it's, very, it's a very detailed question. It's not something I can go into right now. Sure. Uh, and yes, you can perform on demand. That was actually the exact point. It's like it's moving away from models that are used in graphics toward models that answer queries. So the entire point of this project is saying, why do we need meshes? If then we always to take up these meshes and pump them through something else, perform operations on them. Why can't we have networks represent functions and the functions are things that answer questions about the model? So that was exactly the point. Um, can you explain further how the combination of multiple convexes can be combined with a dual convex primal compression? Uh, so think of it this way, uh, convex net has two branches. They do exactly the same thing. One of them is an implicit function. The other one is an explicit function, but they're actually the same. They're just dual version of each other, right? One in the implicit domain and one in the parametric domain. Um, so, and the combination in both cases, uh, in the implicit function, you query the, the function of the point for, for the k different branches, and then you just take a max operation. While uh, if you use now, if you are on the, on the mesh side of things, you have to do constructive solid geometry, right? So you're gonna have to update the topology of the mesh to obtain the full um, uh, two manifold of the, of the solid that you produce. Uh, just a note, we have, uh, um, we have a, a version of convex net and BSP net called Voronoi net, which is currently in development that actually gets around this. Uh, and it produces uh, two manifolds as convex decomposition without intersection by construction. So, but that's not fully ready yet. You can see a technical report and archive. Um, that's it. I think I answered all of the questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And and yeah, really nice talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, so if you have further also have questions, you can also post it in the chat. And let's welcome our next speaker, Professor Katharina Fragiazati from Carnegie Mellon University Machine Learning Department. Um, Katarina has been awarded Google Faculty Award, NSF Career Award, UVMC Faculty Research Award, Sony Faculty Research Award, and she's the ever chair for CVPR this year. Yeah, let's welcome Katarina. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I'll try to share my slides. Mm, share screen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think you can see the, the slides. Um, yeah, so excellent. I, I really like the previous talk. Um, thank you very much. So we'll continue in this um, in the beginning. So let's have a moving agent and let's put the camera on his head and let's observe what he sees. And uh, that's a toddler moving around his house. He sees a lot of things. Um, and uh, yeah, so what do we see? We see dramatic variation in camera viewpoints, in object scales, tons of occlusions. And if we want to do video understanding, video understanding using CNNs that run per frame or using 2D LSTMs or other things that we like, I mean, we run into problems. And those problems are the fact that, uh, you know, there's no object permanence. Objects disappear at occlusions. Objects move with camera motion, right? And we do not know if the object moved or the camera moved. And objects change size as the result of camera zoom in and out. And, and all these problems essentially are due to the entanglement of the camera motion and viewpoint with the scene appearance on 2D 
videos. And um, on the other hand, we have this nice uh, video, uh, you know, SLAM representations. We have Orb SLAM uh, version two, a state of the art uh, SLAM system that also take entangled videos, okay, RGB or RGBD, and manage to separate camera motion that captured in the red, the blue trajectory that you see of camera poses over time, and the point cloud map of the scene. And beautifully, they do this disentanglement, and you know, there is object permanence now. There is object permanence. Objects do not disappear out of occlusions. Uh, so this is what we like about a, a, a slum, but asking the same question as, as the previous speaker, uh, what is the best 3D representation? Is it a mesh, is it a point cloud, or is it a voxel occupancy? Well, the problem is that all the explicit shape representations you know, do not optimize the right end task, which, you know, if we are not graphics people would be, let's say, recognizing and acting in the world, right? So we will look at this part of, um, of you know, the AI tasks that we care about. And indeed, Rodney Brooks uh, in 1991 said that pursuing explicit 3D models is both difficult and unnecessary, right? So if you, this, he said that if you have a complete 3D uh, model of the environment, it's both impossible to obtain, but even if you get it, it still is not going to allow your agents to act in a competent manner. I mean, he's a robotics person. He cares about, you know, robots moving around, doing useful things. Um, so this talk is about using 3D not as the output of the neural representation, but rather as the bottleneck of a neural network architecture. All right. So we'll use geometry as a bias for our, our network architectures. And then we'll see how we can use those, you know, 3D bottlenecked neural nets to do unsupervised visual learning and some, some, some applications in robot control. Um, so this is what we call geometry aware recurrent network is a network that takes a bunch of images as input. This image can be RGB or RGBD and infers a 3D feature map of the scene that the images depict. And for now, please assume that the images are static so that the scene doesn't move uh, okay over time. So only the camera moves. And we built this uh, 3D feature map. So this is very much like the point cloud map of SLAM, but uh, you know, it holds feature vectors, okay? It holds, uh, it holds feature vectors. And the main contribution is that, first of all, it's three-dimensional width by height, by depth, by number of channels. And second of all, the, the way we update that map is using ego motion stabilization. So um, to just to be concrete, imagine that we're looking around the toaster and we fit the image and we pass this image into some differentiable amp rejection operation and, you know, instantiate some voxel grid. And that voxel grid is very incomplete, right? Because it is only a single view for now. But, you know, now we're going to feed it into a 3D convolutional neural net and we allow that voxel grid to be densified and to be painted, essentially, and imagine the missing details from the particular view. And here is our map and here comes the next image. And again, the same thing, we amp project and then we densify. And now here comes the ego stabilization. We infer the 3D pose between our original map and the current frame. We infer essentially the 3D rotation and translation, but that brings these two maps into correspondence. And what we do is we transform our current map to match the coordinate frame of our first time step, all right? Before we fuse the maps, and how do we fuse the maps? We just average them, or we just put our LSTMs or GRUs or whatever we like there. Uh, but it's important to explicitly, you know, using essentially a parameter-free dense transformer layer, cancel ego motion estimation because before you do this this map fusion. And here comes the other frame, and again the same thing, and again ego motion stabilization, and again fusion, and so on. All right, so this is what we call ego motion stabilized latent map update. And what you have gained is here is the corner of the toaster and this corner is all over in the image plane because camera is moving. But after stabilization, that corner of the toaster lands in the same place in our latent 3D map, which is great. Now we have a stable model in our heads, in our neural nets, I mean. Uh, now in contrast, if you have a 2D LSTM, right? What you do is you pass it through some per frame CNN and then you update some hidden state convolutionally. Here comes again the corner of the microwave it is all over in the image space. It's also all over in the feature space because convolutions just do not suffice to handle camera motion. And as you, you know, 
update your hidden state, your hidden state essentially is all over the place. It, it basically, what dictates what the hidden state is, is the camera motion as opposed to the scene. All right, so it's hard to generalize now from one video to the next. So we'll go back to our GRNNs now. Um, what can you do now with this 3D latent map? So this, is, this talk is not about the graphics. Um, it's about using 3D representations for perception and control. So, I mean, something that computer vision people are obsessed with is uh, object detection. So of course you can train that map to do object detection and specifically 3D object detection. So you can just take a mask CNN or your favorite set of the art object detector that takes 2D feature maps as input and spits out 2D boxes and instead feed it 3D feature maps as input and predict 3D boxes. So now your anchors, your anchor box are 3D, everything is 3D, but this is a small change that you can do. And what have you gained? Well, you have object permanence. Even if you move around and an object gets occluded, that object, despite the fact that it doesn't show up in the observation stream, it does show up in the map, right? Same as with SLAM. Things persist over time across occlusions because objects interfere in the 2D space but do not interfere in the latent 3D space. But here comes, so this is what you can do. Okay, great. So another thing that, that, that is maybe more exciting is that you can train those architectures without annotations. To train the object detector, you need to have annotations of object boundary boxes. Um, so another task that we, you know, people are excited about is called view prediction. You have a bunch of views of a scene, and then you put your, you have a query camera viewpoint, and you ask, okay, how will the scene look like from that viewpoint? And then your network will predict, will give you an answer. And then by predicting views, essentially you learn useful features that could be important for semantic related tasks. And you know, cognitive psychologists like that task because they think that the human brain also learns like that. They learn by prediction, by predicting observations in different levels of abstraction. So of course you can train neural nets to do view prediction without the architectural, um, let's say contributions that I discussed, which is a three dimensional hidden state and ego stabilization during latent map update. But I'll show you how adding those architectural biases can allow you to dramatically generalize, okay? Oh, so I, I just basically showed you what is the architecture projection. Here comes our 3D map. We're first going to transform it. This transformation essentially is the spatial transformers and then project it. And the projection also has some knowledge of the camera formation process, right? The image formation process. And then the LSTM will decode it into our image pixels. And then we'll take RGB regression there, something crazy simple, super, super simple. And let's see how it works. So here is some scenes, very simple scenes in the simulation. I give you three images. Um, and then I ask you, how does the scene look like from all the camera viewpoints? And we'll compare GRNN, Geometry Aware RNN, with the other network that does not have biases about image formation, right? The standard 2D network that specifically the neural scene representation and rendering pattern from DeepMind that essentially takes different images in their eco motion and stacks them together and predicts images. And I would like to tell you that both GRNNs and GQNs have been trained here on scenes with only two objects and they are tested on scenes with four objects, as you see in the last two lines. And you know, while GRNNs, there are some artifacts when the GIF rotates multiple times, like plays multiple times, but you just forget about these artifacts. These are just visualization artifacts. So, while the 3D Bolt network can generalize to scenes with more objects that it was trained on, a network that does not have such a 3D neural bottleneck cannot, all right? So it still sees only two objects, despite the fact that we are feeding scenes with four objects. So this form of uh, strong generalizations, right, is very, very important. And uh, it is due to the fact that these GRNNs, you know, represent space in a very nice way in the bottleneck of the network. Um, okay, so now a question that, we're thinking about is, um, and indeed, by the way, this was a work on 2019, and since then we've seen other works that use such a 3D bottlenecks for view prediction um, with continuous maybe bliss representations. One difference between those papers and this is that this is not object-centric. You don't need an object in this, on the center, and also they can generalize. You can train on training scenes, and then you can feed a test scene, and in the test scene, you can only have a single view, and that's okay. It can still predict the full 3D feature map of the scene behind. So because it just it doesn't care about graphics and doing super awesome visuals uh, in every single scene, it cares about representation learning. And in fact, that's what we'll discuss right now. 
The question is how can you go outside of those toy worlds and how can you learn better visual features with this view prediction, right? As opposed to just the neural, neural graphics. And to do that, what we found is that you really need to change the loss function. You can, basically, you really need to give up on generating beautiful images. Um, and instead of predicting actually RGB values, you can predict features. You can predict in the, I have to say intermediate feature presentations. And instead of RGB regression, you can do contrastive view prediction. So here comes again the architecture. Here is the query viewpoint. Uh, again, you featureize it and you estimate the 3D rotation and translation between the map you have and the camera viewpoint you ask the network to predict. And then the network predicts things not in a 2D pixel space, but 2D feature space. It says, oh, I think the abstraction of that view you're looking for looks like that. And its prediction is, let's say, width by height by 64 instead of three, right? Images have three channels. You can have here features of arbitrary length. And uh, here's the query view. You feed it also through a 2D CNN and you featureize it. And everything is trained end to end for what? For pixel-wise contrastive, uh, contrastive uh, loss under pixel-wise contrastive loss. And again, uh, you can sample negatives from outside your batch or inside your batch. Uh, people have shown that outside of the batch helps. Of course, negative sampling is important in contrastive uh, learning, so all the tricks here apply. It's just that, you know, here the contrastive loss has been used with this nice geometry aware neural architectures, okay? And um, yeah, so what can you do with this loss? By, by the way, everything is trained from scratch, nothing is initialized. So you just discover now, you just discover features and these features can track cars. And we have a uh, work under submission that shows that, yeah, these features can, if you initialize a box of an object, can track it through, no problem without ever being trained, um, either on dynamic scenes with moving objects, just by having static scenes and looking around, right? You learn good features, uh, correspondable features. And another thing that we use this for is as a pre-training for 3D object detection. And indeed, you see that, I mean, training from scratch is a bad idea. But, uh, you know, the green curve has been trained with RGB regression. Now, I want to tell you that we also tried some basic VAE variants of that architecture, still didn't work much well, much better. But if you use view contrast prediction, now, of course, you have given up graphics, but look, you can do better visual representation learning. Let's say the red curve goes higher. Of course, everything is inspired from rendering and uh, architectures about, you know, the 3D scene and so on. Um, yeah, so, now, the truth is that people can segment and detect objects in 3D without ever being shown boxes or masks. Uh, the, the, the curves that I just showed is like, okay, you do your pre-training, and here comes a small label set, how well you do. And uh, I forgot to mention that, uh, okay, the x-axis is the labels. The, more, the less labels, the more the unsupervised pre-training helps. But we know humans can do this job without ever being seeing any annotation. Um, and uh, here comes a dynamic scene. What is a dynamic scene is a scene where not only the camera moves, but also the, the independently moving objects. And here I'm showing your, the feature maps of the scene. And you see they have not been ego stabilized. They haven't been put into correspondence yet. Uh, but here on the right now they've been into correspondence. And I don't know if you see, but the moving objects, two cars do pop out, right? Because once you stabilize, you, once you have, uh, how to say, accounted for your camera motion, the only moving part is the independently moving objects. Uh, unfortunately, you see some other things um, uh, switching on and off. It has to do with boundary effects and so on. And despite that, still the search for the best in painting architecture to do this to incomplete voxel to full voxel, uh, we're still working on this. Right now, this we're using a very plain 3D CNN for that part. So of course, the slower the features, the better, right? The more disentangled and so on. But you can effectively take, uh, take advantage of that and compute 3D optical flow on that latent 3D space and detect moving objects. And um, yeah, you can have good prof moving objects essentially merge without any annotations with their full 3D extent. And we're talking about 3D object segmentations as opposed to boxes. And you can rank those proposals if you like based on you know, center surround score, how center surround of the motion field I mean, and yes, the correct proposal will come out. And you can train a moving object detection in 3D Right, not in 2D because we have seen, uh, you know, uh, 2D video segmentation from you know clustering of 2D point trajectories, but you know here it's in 3D. 
Uh, and yes, we do better than using just depth and ego motion without ever going to the full imagination 3D space, all right? Um, okay. Now, another question we ask is, so far our 3D feature map is just a mush of features, lots of features, geometrically consistent over time. But the idea, the question here is, can we learn to parse our world into prototypes? Um, prototypes meaning visual concepts. And what should the representation of those visual concepts be? Okay. Um, the first, so here is the replica data set. Uh, so, so we see fantastic uh, simulated environments coming out all the time, which is extremely helpful because all this research is based on multiple views because view prediction is the basic and supervised mechanism for feature learning in this work and is used everywhere from since the slide just shows up. So here we have the replica data set. And what you can see in the replica data set is that, uh, take a look on these two pictures here up. You see the same object, very similar object, this white armchair looking very different. Why? Because of the scale and because of the camera projection and the camera viewpoint. While in 3D, if you would be able to imagine the feature map of that chair in both scenes, it would be very similar because the camera viewpoint is so different Things look different. And a very basic principle to be able to uh, discover concepts, visual concepts, is to be able to discover commonalities in the visual world, to learn, for example, that, oh yeah, this pen looks like that other pen, and so on. And right now, the same pen looks so different simply because I view it from different viewpoints, okay? So 3D feature representations for sure are very important for building these databases and so on. Uh, here we'll build a database in terms of 3D feature maps. Um, we want, yeah, 3D feature maps. Our, our architecture spit out 3D feature maps. The prototypes will also be parsed in terms of 3D feature maps. So there is an agreement between what the neural net can spit out and what the database is. Instead of having a database, for example, in terms of meshes, and then we need to go from, you know, deep features to meshes and so on. Um, so, oh, well, for sure, the feature must may not be the final answer of what should the prototypes be, but this is what we tried anyhow. So the, the, the important thing about these prototypes is that the same object under all different scales, all different poses should be explained by the same single prototype because while you're ma matching objects to prototypes, okay, uh, you do scale and you do exhaustive rotation search, okay? And what I'm showing here is some very simple images where you see the 3D bounding boxes and each bounding box is labeled with a label. And the label is not like um, a lemon or banana or whatever because we're not supervised, but it is cluster 10, cluster 15, cluster six is the number of the prototype and the rotation. What is the pose of the prototype that matches the image, okay? And of course, exhaustive rotation matching is super expensive, but it can be parallelized. And there is, I mean, learning policies of what to match first or what to match later and how to retrieve the closest neighbors quickly and then do the rotation matching to, to accelerate essentially the parsing, of course, are very, very important. So, you know, in this work, essentially what we did is we started with a bunch of scenes. And then again, we started with view prediction. We started with some good, good 2D objectness detector and triangulated some um, 2D boxes. We got, got some uh, semi-crappy 3D boxes, but then we iterated between clustering and updating the prototypes to rotation aware matching and then reparsing and so on Till, you know, you clean up your detector and you clean up your prototype and so on. Um, yeah, so now here is your, your prototype 14. It seems to be a red pepper. And then here comes the different views and you can project from different views. Now, one question is, are you gonna have a different prototype for red pepper, green pepper, orange pepper, yellow pepper? Uh, that's a great uh, question. Uh, no, actually you can also disentangle style and shape for every object. In fact, we have this under submission and then you can learn your prototypes on content code so that you don't waste representation power on color and be able to infer something even under uh, you know, different coloring. In the same way as humans, like they can say, for example, a purple elephant, well, despite the fact they've never seen a purple elephant before. So here we do the same parsing in different uh, data sets. Uh, this is the Carla data set and so on. And here is the real world. And unfortunately in the real world, uh, the depth and uh, ego motion are given from a slab. Algorithm, ideally, we want our neural network to spit out awesome, uh, basically awesome ego motion estimation, uh, but we're working on that. Uh, it's hard to beat the slam thing, but you know, it's not too hard. Um, 
Okay, yeah, that's it. Um, oh, yeah, so I have some slides on how can you use now those representations for control? How can 3D feature representations help you manipulate objects? Well, one obvious thing you can see is that we're talking about very simple manipulation, just pushing objects around, right? But you push objects around, there's clutter. So at some point, one object can hide behind the other. Well, that's not a problem anymore because you have a 3D feature map. So this object is going to move and it's going to take a place in your feature map. And that's totally fine. It's not going to disappear. While if you were doing everything from 2D images, you are in trouble. Okay? So now things become very, very easy. Uh, very, very easy because we have permanence and so on. Uh, I mean, okay, this is kind of a simple scene. I'm going to show you other scenes. Uh, what do you do? You take your video. It can be single view at test time. The whole point of GRNNs is that at training time, you require multiple views. You can learn to imagine from a single view a full 3D feature scene. And now at test time, you can just use a single view. And you know you can detect your objects and build your, your, your graph neural network on top of those detected objects in that representation. Okay, And you do exactly the same thing that people do in 2D images. They center around the object and they concatenate the action and try to predict where the object went. But now it's in 3D. You need to center around the object, look at its context, you can encode other objects using a graph and so on and predict the 3D rotation and translation of that object. And yeah, you can do pretty good predictions. Um, the other cool thing, the other thing that you get as a byproduct is what? You can generalize across viewpoints. In fact, we have seen that a 2D, you know, similarly object-centric network, graph RNN, graph neural network over 2D objects, does also quite competitively in a single view but as long as, as soon as you change the camera viewpoint, things break down. In our network, we learn on top of those view invariant tensors, so things don't break down. Basically, you can generalize across viewpoints. Okay, uh, multiple objects is not an issue. So just to understand what's happening, here is the scene, and you can pick any viewpoint you like. And um, on the side, I'm showing the 3D feature map, what the network sees. Now you may see that it's very blurry. Uh, yeah, those 3D feature representations are extremely memory uh, intense. Those maps are 64 by 64 by 64 by number of channels. And that's okay, 64 is enough because it's just one gripper and one object. I also want to mention at this point that, yeah, with those representations, what we found both for object detection, no, object detection is fine, but object tracking, we found that, yeah, you really need to zoom around the object and to feature as, you know, a smaller part of the image into a 3D map and so on. Uh, so, I have some results of this architecture on, on simulation and real robot, but uh, because I'm a little bit out of time, I'm not sure I can uh, show the, yeah, it can generalize. Um, this is, by the way, under submission, this, uh, so you cannot find them anywhere. But the other thing is that, yeah, clutter now is not a problem, and so on. And this is just an initial, you know, use of those 3D feature maps for manipulation, this very, very initial. And we also have dropping the results, like how do you drop objects on top of other objects and so on. Uh, so a summary of what we said is that those 3D bottleneck neural nets can help inject some spatial reasoning into deep nets and deep uh, for, for visual recognition. Uh, we also showed how we can learn without human annotations uh, by um, two things, by view prediction and by associating things across different scenes and associations correspondence is improving 3D space as opposed to 2D because 3D does not suffer from projection artifacts and yes, learn object dynamics without, you know, having a heart attack when things get occluded or when the camera changes viewpoints, which is good. Um, these are the, the students that actually did all the work. Uh, the last paper I really didn't mention because it's about language and this workshop is not about language, but it's just in this CVPR, uh, you know, is this in this CVPR conference if you wanna check it out. Uh, thank you very much again for, for your time and thank you for your invitation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Karina, for your nice talk. So uh, I think due to time limitation, we have one question, live question. Uh, oh, okay, I think there's one question already asked in the, uh, already asked in the Q&A, in the chat box. Yeah. Okay, so I should uh, stop sharing and look at the chat box, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the question is from Mohammed and her, his, uh, and the question is typically how many channels are there in these feature maps? So if oh, more yeah, than great, three, great. how to decide? Right, so there are of course way more than three. 
uh, they're um, like 6428. The whole point is that you have this feature vector to capture uh, whatever you like. And uh, how do we visualize in three? Excellent question. We do PCA and then we do color coding. We keep the only the three, uh, you know, important dimension and then we uh, color code. That's what we do. Yep. Okay. Yeah, got it. So uh, if the participant has any more questions, we can also discuss it in the chat, chat room. Yeah, sure. and Karina, if you have time, you can also feel free to chat with them. Yeah, so uh, next come, uh, is our last oral session. We'll still have three invited papers. So I will share the screen and just show all the, their videos. And if you have any questions for those uh, invited papers, feel free to use the chat room. Hi everyone, I'm Fei Xia from Stanford University. Today, I would like to introduce our work on Interactive Gibson, a simulator for embodied visual agents. Interactive Gibson Environments is led by Fei Fei and Silvio, and it, it, it is a large team effort involving many students at SVL. We hope to provide a simulation environment that could benefit our research projects as well as a broader community. So what is iGibson? Let me first briefly introduce what it is, and then I will explain the backgrounds and dive into details. First of all, iGibson is a virtual environment where we simulate a robotic agent, for example, a fetch robot in this slide. And we render the virtual images of the environment to simulate sensors of the robot. And the robot is immersed in many of such large environments reconstructed from real houses. We also simulate realistic physics, so the robot can freely interact with objects in this scene. To give you some uh, quantitative numbers of uh, how large is I Gibson, so I Gibson is, has a large data set of real world reconstructed buildings. We have 572 buildings, uh, which is 1,400 floors. So we are in the process of annotating in this, these environments to become fully interactive. So currently we have 10 partially interactive environments and one fully interactive environments. As we annotate the, these environments, we will make them available to a broader community. Secondly, uh, iGibson provides physically re realistic simulations of active agents. We have 14 types of ac active agents. Uh, some of them correspond to a real robots. Thirdly, uh, this is much, very much work in progress. We want to simulate realistically uh, fully interactive environments where you can interact with any object in the scene. So um, we want it to follow the real world distribution and also the material properties and physics properties. We also want those to be realistic. So why do we want to take such a huge endeavor to build simulation environments? This is inspired by James J. Gibson, after whom our simulation environment Gibson was named. He was an Amer American psychologist that defended the idea that perception is an active process performed by embodied agents in their ecological environments. This was in contrast with a common view at the time of perception as a passive signal processing paradigm. So indeed, uh, we do not want to ask what's inside the head, we want to ask what your head is inside of. So that's why we want to build such an ecological environment, Gibson. Our goal is to create an interactive environment where a robotic agent can perform interactive tasks, just like human. As the first step towards our goal, we created Gibson V1. Just to provide a recap for Gibson V1, it is an embodied navigation agent simulation environment that is mainly geared towards robot navigation. The well-defined task in Gibson V1 is point-to-point -point navigation. The visuals are rendered with neural rendering, which is realistic but occasionally blurry. The agents in Gibson V1 supported ranges from mobile robots to quadcopters. However, the main limitation is that the mesh is a monolithic piece and doesn't support fine grain manipulations. Thus, the task we can define in this environment is rather limited. However, as we provide a large database of 3D recon reconstructed environments, the sheer scale and fidelity fueled a lot of creative works in the computer vision and the robotics community. 
Some representative works are shown in this slide. People have been using Gibson V1 to train topological navigation, planning, and control for mobile robots and quadcopters. As Gibson V1 comes with many modality, researchers have discovered that using mid-level representation can not only make the reinforced learning train faster, but the generalization performance is also better. There are other works that explore navigating completely without map or compass, or navigate only using a sequence of images. Some of these works successfully transfer the policy to real, which is a testimonial of the scale and fidelity of such environments. As we want to explore using Gibson Beyond Navigation, we feel the need of developing a new environment that addresses the shortcomings of Gibson V1. We need an environment that is both visually realistic and allows free interaction with the environment. So currently on the market, there is no simulator supporting that. That's why we developed the iGibson. iGibson is a big system with three level hierarchy from assets to tasks. So on the very bottom level, it is composed of different assets, uh, different 3D reconstructions of the environments and annotation on these environments to make them interactable, as well as the CAD models we provide uh, to in these environments to make, the, make them interactable. On the middle level, it's a simulation engine, which include the physics engine to simulate the interactions, and also a rendering engine that can render different modalities of visuals. On the top level is the tasks, definition, and benchmarks. So currently we have navigation tasks, interactive navigation tasks, such as like going through a door. Um, we will include more tasks in the future. And also we have a robot learning infrastructure. Basically we model all the robots and uh, can simulate all the sensors. Now let's dive deeper into iGibson. Let me highlight some important features that we are able to achieve in iGibson. These features include physics realism, visual quality, ecological distribution of environments, and speed and efficiency. So first, uh, it's about physics realism. Previously, we cannot interact with the environment, so the robot will basically collide into the mesh and slide, which is not very realistic. Now, if the robot run into a chair, the chair will move with the robot, as would happen in the real life. We can also use the robot itself to push objects to simulate such type of non-prehensile manipulations. And we can also use a robot to open doors, which uh, can facilitate the robot to go from one room to another room. In the iGibson project, we always prioritize high visual quality. For the 3D reconstructions of the environment, the qualities are high because they are reconstructed from the real environments. When we replace objects uh, with CAD models and when we replace the entire scene with CAD models, we also want to highlight the visual quality. We use a combination of uh, ray tracing ba based texture baking and uh, real-time rendering to make the visual quality high. Because the fully interactive environments are defined after 3D reconstruct environments, they follow the same object distribution. So you would likely to find uh, a tower near a kitchen counter. So we think this type of distribution is very important for learning important skills for robotic agents. Finally, we still want iGibson to render very fast. So our uh, rendering engine is actually very efficient. It can render frame up to 1,000 frames per second. This will accelerate robot learning. So previously, it would take days, weeks. Uh, now it could just uh, take hours or overnight. In this version, we include a cleaned environment with fully interactive sets of objects. We want to scale this up and release more of such environment. This will be our next step. As a summary, I presented iGibson, a state-of-the-art simulator to train robots for visual motor tasks, navigation, and manipulation. iGibson includes hundreds of models of real-world large environments with interactive objects, and it enables easier sim-to-real transfer of learned strategy thanks to realistic virtual images it generates. We are always improving iGibson, so we welcome researchers around the world to, to check it out. 
To check it out, you can download and try iGibson from GitHub. The simulator is open source and free. The community is growing rapidly, and we are happy to help you uh, to use it in your research. We have made the installation process easier, so currently you only need to run one pip command. The pip command will download the environment to your computer and start demos. Uh, there is one demo that will use the reconstruct environment, and there is another demo that will use the fully interactive environment. Uh, please check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the. Uh, thank you. I think I can take questions. Uh, I already saw the Vendra's question of how do you determine the physical property of the object in the scene, such as friction coefficient, reflectivity, etc. So uh, currently, we just a sample from a distribution of a re real objects. Um, later, we will uh, incorporate annotation pipelines that, like uh, human, human can annotate the. Uh, for example, mean and variance of a class of object, and then we can sample from that. Uh, in terms of um, like optics um, property, so currently we, we, we just take whatever uh, from the material. So for example, our materials might come with a BRDF, so we just uh, take um, that, that values. Uh, second question is about Unity. Uh, why don't we develop a new environment not using Unity. I think that the main issue is the speed. So Unity, um, they're mostly geared towards games and they can run about 60 frames per second, maybe a little bit faster. Um, so we, in reinforcement learning, we wanted to be at least 100 to 1000 frames per second. So we um, highly optimize the rendering engine. And also the uh, physics for game engines is uh, usually a little bit compromised um, for, for accuracy. Um, so to optimize for speed. So um, it's, it's not quite likely they will transfer to the real world. Um, we use PyBullet, which uh, a lot of projects has been using that and show success stories of transferring to real world. So uh, we base our stack basically on PyBullet and uh, our own rendering engine. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And so that's go ahead with the next slide paper. Hi, my name is Devendra, and I'm going to talk about our work on neural topological slump for visual navigation. Consider an autonomous agent dropped in a new environment and shown a target image to navigate to. In this example, if we show an image of an oven, most humans would use path number two as it's leading to the kitchen. Humans use semantic priors and common sense to explore and navigate every day. In this paper, we design a navigation model which can learn about such semantic priors. In our image goal navigation task setup, agent observations and goal images are panoramas, and the objective is to take low-level navigation actions to reach the goal image. The agent also needs to take the stop action when it reaches close to the goal image in order to succeed. We would also like the agent to navigate to sequential goals efficiently, which means if the agent is shown a second goal image after reaching the first one, it should use the episodic experience so far to navigate to the second goal efficiently. The image goal navigation task requires the agent to have a long-term memory, learn state estimation, and use semantic priors to explore efficiently. Learning about all these things implicitly in an end-to-end -end fashion is extremely expensive. Therefore, prior navigation methods based on end-to-end -end learning suffer from high sample complexity as well as poor generalization, especially in large environments. Modular metric map based methods, which include both classical robotic systems as well as more recent learning based systems, can be more data efficient. However, they do not have any way to learn about semantic priors, and they suffer from pose error accumulation in large environments as they rely on accurate pose estimations. Instead of using metric maps, we use topological maps to maintain an explicit episodic memory. Topological maps do not suffer from the issues of pose error accumulation as they do not rely on precise pose estimation. In our topological graph representation, Nodes denote areas in the physical space, and edges denote the spatial relationship between them. We use two types of nodes, regular nodes, which denote areas already explored, and ghost nodes, which denote areas which are explorable but not explored so far. Each regular node is associated with a panoramic image. Each time the agent adds a regular node to the graph, 
It also predicts which directions are explorable from that node and adds a ghost node for each explorable direction. We then select a ghost node to explore based on the given goal image. As the agent navigates through the scene, it creates new regular nodes and adds new ghost nodes to the regular nodes. Each time a new node is created, we store the relative position of the new node from the last node. In order to build a topological map and use it efficiently for navigation, we require the model to learn four different functions. The first one, called geometric prediction function, predicts the directions which are explorable in the given panoramic image. We split the image into 12 equal patches and predict whether our patch is explorable or not. The second function, called the semantic score prediction function, predicts the score of every explorable patch to reach a particular goal image. This function is responsible for learning semantic priors. When the goal image is of a living room as shown on the left, the score of the directions in the center should be higher as they lead to the living room. Whereas if the goal image is of a bedroom as shown on the right, the scores corresponding to the pathway on the left should be higher as they are more likely to lead to the bedroom. The third function, called the localization function, predicts whether two images belong to the same node or not. And finally, the fourth function predicts the relative pose between two input images. We design a modular model called Neural Topological SLAM, which uses these four learnable functions to build topological maps and navigate to image goals efficiently. It consists of three components, a graph update module, a global policy, and a local policy. The graph update module builds and updates the topological map as it receives observation. It first tries to localize the current image in the regular nodes existing in the map using the localization function. If the image is not localized, it adds a new node and uses the geometric prediction function to add ghost nodes to this new node. Each time a new node is added, we use the relative pose prediction function to estimate the relative pose of the new node with respect to the last node. The global policy samples sub-goals based on the goal image. It first tries to localize the goal image in the nodes existing in the map using the localization function. If the goal is not localized, it uses the semantic score prediction function to score all the ghost nodes and picks the ghost node with the highest score as the long-term goal. The long-term goal is then converted to a sub-goal using graph path planning. If the goal image is localized in the current node, it uses the relative post prediction function to get the relative direction of the goal image. Finally, the local policy takes navigational actions to reach the sub-goal using local metric maps and analytical path planning. Our formulation allows us to train the complete system using a single supervised learning model to learn all the four functions. It does not require any interaction or reinforcement learning and can be trained completely with static image data. Here we show an example trajectory using the neural topological SLAM model. At the beginning of the episode, the agent creates a regular node at the current location and adds ghost nodes in explorable directions using the geometric prediction function. It then scores the ghost nodes based on the goal image using the semantic score prediction function and selects the ghost node with the highest score. In this case, the goal image is of a living room and the agent correctly chooses the ghost node which leads down the hallway instead of other ghost nodes leading to different bedrooms. As the agent navigates to the ghost node, it creates new nodes when it cannot localize the current image in the previous node. The agent successfully reaches the goal image after creating four nodes. Here we show an example which indicates that the model learns semantic priors. Given the same starting location, if we change the goal image in a living room to a goal image in a bedroom, the model correctly picks one of the bedroom ghost nodes as the long-term goal. Quantitative results show that our model outperforms both end-to-end -end learning as well as modular metric map based methods on the image goal navigation task. Results indicate that our model better captures semantic priors and is more robust to pose noise as compared to the baselines. Ablation study on sequential goals indicates that the semantic score function improves efficiency in the absence of prior episodic experience, while the topological map improves efficiency as the episodic experience increases. For more details, please visit the project webpage. Thank you for listening. My name is Devendra and I am happy to answer questions over email. I think we have some, uh, a few minutes, so if the authors of the visual slam would like to address some 
uh, questions, feel free to do so in live. Yeah. So, do you like to have any uh, live discussions? Okay. Um, I assume we can just go ahead to the next photo invited paper. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to present at this workshop. So uh, this is going to be a talk about a paper, Local Deep Implicit Functions for 3D Shapes, uh, which is a collaboration between Princeton University and Google. Um, so let's dive right in. So there's been a lot of progress on uh, representing shapes uh, with a learned implicit surface function. Uh, occupancy networks is an example of this. And uh, the idea here is that you, know, you, you have this learned function f of x, where x is a location in 3D space, and the network learns a scalar uh, output um, that gives you inside outside at x, y, z. And uh, while this has been great for single view reconstruction and auto encoding, I want to talk about one limitation of this approach, which is that the global latent code um, that is sort of the bottleneck layer of this setup, the output of the encoder, the input to the decoder besides the XYZ location, has to describe the whole shape all at once. And in doing so, it makes it hard to scale or generalize beyond the training classes, because that's what the latent space describes. Now, putting that aside for a second, there's been recent work on learning a structured decomposition of space. Uh, so in this uh, um, paper, there's a, like a learned structural uh, decomposition that has uh, repeatable shape elements, which here are rendered as Gaussian ellipsoids, that uh, are always sort of in the same uh, location relative to one another, deforming as sort of an unsupervised template space. And uh, that's been good for shape analysis, but not so much for uh, shape reconstruction. Now, the key idea of our paper is to use a template, an unsupervised learn template, to have local latent codes that contain an implicit surface um, embedding that can be decoded in the same way, but have a, a position and an extent in space that's determined by an RBF falloff function that the global template provides. And we then can uh, combine the local uh, uh, decoded functions and blend them, um, and we get uh, a reconstruction that's higher fidelity and uh, more generalizable and more efficient. So uh, this is similar to uh, structured implicit functions because we have this unsupervised learned template, but uh, distinct in that we also have latent features associated with each template element, and it's similar to occupancy networks except that uh, we represent, um, we have a local feature vectors, not a single global one. Okay, so uh, our pipeline uh, takes in one or more depth images. Now, uh, for autoencoding, say if you have a mesh, then what you can do is uh, render um, a stack of depth images, uh, a dodecahedron of them, uh, which will give you uh, so images like this, and then that will be the input. Um, or if you have uh, just a single depth image, as long as it's posed, that's fine too. Um, you just need the extrinsics. So given that, the next thing that we do is we uh, extract the uh, shape elements using a ResNet. And uh, this gives us the analytic parameters of each of the Gaussian ellipsoids, and those define affine coordinate frames, which we can then use to uh, get the neural features. So the way we're going to do that is we uh, take the depth images, we use the extrinsics to unproject them into a, um, a point cloud, 
and um, then we transform them into each of the local coordinate frames of the ellipsoids, right, which gives us a point cloud like you're seeing here, the, the head uh, point cloud. Then um, we run that through a point net um, and get a feature vector for the uh, particular shape element. We repeat this in turn for each of the shape elements and uh, we get a set of uh, feature vectors that way. If you concatenate the template parameters and the deep features, that gives you the entire representation. And if you would like to evaluate it at a query location in space to get inside outside at that location in space, then you transform the query to a particular frame um, of one of the elements. You compute the analytic influence of the RBF function uh, there. You have a local decoder, which is a small network that goes from XYZ to uh, the scalar. And uh, we have a way of combining them. You can look in the paper for more details. And then that's RBF weighted. So you sum up for all of the embedding vec, you sum up for all of the shape elements. And that gives you the overall inside outside function value uh, for that location. Um, now, if you want to evaluate on a, a local grid, you can get a mesh back out of that um, if you're on marching cubes. Now I'm gonna show shape autoencoding experiments. This is the first of the experiments. This is intended to sort of show, uh, answer the question if, it, if partial observations are not a concern, if you have full information, how detailed and accurate can the representation be? So uh, here we see pre performance improvements in the detail um, uh, of the reconstructions and how well they um, uh, match, match the local parts, right? Um, but this doesn't tell you the whole story, just looking at a few examples. So I wanna convince you a little more thoroughly. So here are all of the results on the test set, which is 8,746 shapes um, sorted by our F score. So that's the blue curve, is our result sorted by F-score. Then uh, we show uh, the orange curve is OCNET's performance on the same shapes. Um, the rolling mean is the curve, and then the faded orange behind it is the example on the specific shapes. The same for SIF in green. Uh, we uh, have the highest reconstruction uh, results um, uh, on 90% of examples. And uh, one other thing to note is that it appears that the shapes are similarly difficult for all uh, methods. Um, the LDIF representation also uh, uh, generalizes uh, better than uh, using a single latent vector. Uh, so if you go to unseen classes like piano, printer, camera, uh, the delta between uh, existing methods and LDIF increases. Next, we show um, completing a posed depth image. So the input depth image show, is shown as a posed point cloud on the left. Then the uh, second column, the shape you'd like to complete. Third column, our result. Fourth column, uh, current state of the art. And uh, we see about a 15 point improvement for LDIF compared to existing methods. Uh, LDIF also does well for template fitting, so uh, it doesn't do nearly as well as supervised methods, which require a handcrafted template and uh, key point annotations, but it does improve over uh, SIF, uh, uh, which is to say we are for sort of unsupervised template fitting and registration. Um, there's also a consistent decomposition of shape, so uh, here you can see that um, even though there was no supervision on the uh, uh, correspondence, the uh, algorithm automatically finds sort of a coarse correspondence between these different posed humans. Um, you can see sort of the template color indicates the ID, ID identifier for the template element. Uh, finally, um, uh, efficient decoding is another big benefit. So. Uh, F-score improves by uh, 10 points, but at the same time, the number of decoder parameters decreases by two orders of magnitude, which uh, makes it possible to evaluate just densely on a 128-cubed grid at 20 frames a second, uh, so no need for 
um, more sophisticated uh, inference methods there as long as that's fast enough. And uh, so, yeah, I just want to leave you that the key idea is to represent uh, shapes with global templates that have local latent codes associated with the template elements that give you the fine details. And that lets you be more generalizable, higher fidelity, and uh, more efficient. So thanks very much for watching. Uh, there is a code uh, available at ldiff.cs.princeton.edu. And these are the, uh, uh, the authors. Um, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all the, um, for the all the sessions. So, so if you have any questions, also feel free to use the chat room to flash your um, questions. And so next, let's move to our uh, next invited speaker. Um, our next speaker is Professor Sergey Levine from UC Berkeley. Um, Professor Sergey Levine leads the Robotic Artificial Intelligence and Learning Lab, and his research focuses on the intersection between control and machine learning. And his work has been featured in many popular press outlets, including the New York Times, BBC, MIT Technology Review, and Bloomberg Businesses. So I think due to the um, due to the due to kind of network issue, I will just um, show the pre-recorded video on behalf of Sergey. And if you also have any questions, just feel free to use the chat box to chat. Yeah, so if the talk is being presented over video, then I'm free to answer your questions while that's happening. So um, please don't be shy to ask things and I'll try to reply. Okay, let me share my screen. Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and I'm going to talk about embodied implicit scene understanding. So when we think about how machines can understand the world, perhaps it's most natural for us to think about it structurally in terms of building up useful representations like geometry and physical properties and then utilizing them to perform downstream tasks. Um, so this is a very reasonable way to approach this question uh, if we think about scene understanding kind of as engineers, because as engineers, we're taught that engineering problems are more manageable if they can be reduced to the right abstractions. Uh, in fact, arguably this approach to scene understanding is as old as computer vision. If you think about perception as inverting the physical process that gives rise to images, essentially kind of an inverse graphics, uh, that's uh, perhaps one of the earliest ways to approach computational perception. And it's a very reasonable way to start thinking about the problem. But I think some of the evidence that we have in recent years suggests that to enable capable autonomous machines, a different an approach might be more effective. The trouble with this very explicit way of thinking about scene understanding is that it requires us to manually specify the right intermediate representations. And while it might be straightforward to do this in simple idealized environments consisting of simple rigid objects with uh, uh, you know, smooth faces, the real world is never quite so complex. And perhaps this is why the most successful methods for perception and increasingly the most effective methods in robotics actually get rid of manual specification of abstractions uh, and instead utilize end-to-end -end training to acquire the right representation for the job. So you might take a large data set, a large, largely undifferentiated high-capacity model, and then use it to learn to perform some very complex task. And while we might uh, say that such an approach perhaps uh, loses some of the interpretability or maybe even some of the generality of more explicit methods that specify the representation, uh, in practice it tends to work quite a bit better. Now, we might be tempted at this point to think of these kind of end-to-end -end approaches as being more narrow and task-specific because they're typically trained on a task. So we could imagine that the world works like this, that there is a kind of the world of platonic ideal representations, which we know and which we define ourselves, and then the world of end-to-end -end learning, where the end-to-end -end world is task-specific and these idealized representations are general purpose. Uh, but here, too, recent evidence suggests that this may not quite be the case. So we know, for example, that in computer vision, if we take a large high capacity model and train it on a large data set and then pull out the features from that model, those features can actually be useful for many other visual perception tasks. 
So somehow, somehow in the process of learning this seemingly specific task, this model actually acquired what we might call an understanding of visual scenes. So end-to-end -end systems that can actually learn general concepts. What this brings us to is that there are kind of two differing views of scene understanding. There is a classic view that says that task success is what you get when you combine data with the right representation of your scene. And then there is what I would call the epiphenomenon view, which says that we should view scene understanding as an epiphenomenon or an emergent consequence of performing well at a sufficiently large variety of sufficiently complex tasks. So the epiphenomenon view essentially contradicts this way of looking at end-to-end -end training, uh, and this is actually going to be the focus of my talk. There's an important caveat that I want to make here, though, which is that this view is predicated on the notion that tasks are broad and general enough. And we could argue that if the task is so general, uh, like, for example, image net classification or even some representation learning objectives, maybe those are, in fact, seen understanding tasks. And I think that's a very valid way of looking at it. The crucial distinction to me between the classic view and the epiphenomenon view is that the epiphenomenon view doesn't require us to select the representation ourselves. The representation of the scene, the way that understanding is represented, emerges naturally uh, as a consequence of performing tasks. So what would it take to understand the world via end-to-end -end learning? There's one challenge with this, which is that the world is pretty complex. If we think about our universe, like, yes, it has galaxies, it has stars, it has physics, it has uh, kind of the day-to-day the -day complexity of objects we interact with, visually very complex scenes, other agents, and so on. It's tempting to imagine that if you just show a model enough pictures of our universe, it will actually learn to understand our universe. So you could, for instance, think about an image capturing model or a visual question answering model and consider how such a model might understand the world. And we've seen some examples where, for example, image capturing models can actually do a pretty decent job of learning some meaningful concepts. Like, for example, uh, that this is a picture of a group of people standing around a room with remotes. But such models can also make some pretty silly mistakes. Like, for example, concluding that there's a toilet with a seat up in this picture, uh, where, of course, there's a bathroom without a toilet, or that this picture of a person in a furry coat is actually a teddy bear. I think part of the reason for these kinds of issues is that, in fact, the universe of the image capturing model or the visual question answering model or the image classification model doesn't quite match our universe. It looks like our universe, but its physics are different. In the image capturing universe, you see sequences of images, one after the other, with corresponding phrases, but you don't get the interaction, you don't get the physics, you don't get the uh, action response tuples. So I think that in order to get scene understanding to truly emerge from end-to-end -end learning, you need an embodied learning recipe, one where you have an agent that interacts with the world and observes the consequences of its actions, attempts to succeed at a variety of meaningful tasks, and from doing so, accomplishes some kind of understanding of the world. So what I'm going to talk about today are a number of projects that we've done that try to basically provide a little bit of evidence for this hypothesis. One of the things we have to select is what end-to-end -end tasks we're going to use. And remember that it is important which task we use. The tasks have to be broad and general enough to require meaningful understanding of the world. I'm going to talk about two broad categories of tasks. Model-free tasks, which you can think of as predicting future rewards, and model-based tasks, which you can think of as predicting future observations. Well, let's start with the model-free setup. I'm going to begin with a, a small experiment that we did at this point about five years ago, around 2015, to try to just understand how end-to-end -end learning might differ from explicit modeling of scenes. And this is some work that was done uh, together uh, with Chelsea Finch, Trevor Darrell, and Peter Beale. It was actually uh, done during my postdoc, where we wanted to get this PR2 robot to learn to insert a shape into a shape sorting cube. So it was an autonomous training process. So here you can see the robot actually practicing putting in the shape sorting cube, and it's supposed to learn to do this task from images. And then at test time, Chelsea could hold the shape sorting cube in her hand, and the robot would figure out where it is and insert the shape. But one of the things we want to understand in this paper is whether the end-to-end -end training of these uh, visuomotor skills was actually important for good performance. At the time, this was a very controversial question, because at the time, most robotics researchers did not think that deep learning, much less deep reinforcement learning, was actually a viable strategy in robotics. So it was sort of up to us to demonstrate its value. So what we did is we set up a comparison where we train a model that just localizes the hole in the shape sorting cube. 
And we could localize it was with 1.3 centimeters of error, which compares well with kind of state-of-the-art methods at the time from monocular localization. But the tolerance on the shape and the shape sorting cube was just a few millimeters. So this error by itself was actually too much to perform the task. It turned out that if you actually use the predictive pose to do the task, you would never succeed. If you use the features from that model, you would succeed sometimes. And if you train the whole model end to end, you would succeed almost all the time. The reason for this, of course, is that it's neither necessary nor sufficient to accurately localize the whole. The robot just needs to put the shape in. The vertical position matters a lot less. The horizontal position matters less if it uses a robust strategy. So the end-to-end -end learning could take advantage of these properties. It could perform just enough perception to do the task, whereas the uh, modular approach could not. Now, of course, to really get an understanding of the scene, we need much broader tasks, much more general objectives, and much more data. So much more recently, back in 2018, we built a system called QTOpt, which is a robotic learning system uh, that essentially extends Q-learning. And its aim is to enable large-scale training of robotic manipulation skills from many robots collected over lar large periods of time. We applied this system to the task of robotic grasping. So we collected data from about 1,000 training objects, collected about 600,000 training grasp attempts, and then set up a deep convolutional neural network to represent the Q function with 1.2 million parameters. The only grasping specific feature in this whole system was actually the reward function, which was one if the robot grasped an object successfully. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the details of how this thing actually worked. What I want to talk about primarily is the kind of behaviors that end up emerging from this training process. Although the system was only trying to grasp objects, in the course of doing that, it actually acquired some pretty interesting behaviors. For example, here we're going to have a person actually perturb the robot, and you can see that it responds intelligently. It immediately goes in for another grasp. When it picks up some uh, easy objects, it just grasps them right away. When it gets a difficult object like this round tennis ball, if the object gets knocked out of the gripper, it's sort of not confused by that. It actually repositions the hand and eventually picks up the object. When it tries to pick up a small, difficult object like this clothes hook, it's actually going to fail on the first attempt, but it's actually watching what happens, and it notices that when it fails, it needs to reposition the gripper and try again. The system can grasp objects in dense clutter, objects that are transparent, large, small, and so on. Uh, and in the process of doing this grasping, it does a lot of interesting things like probing objects, repositioning them, moving clutter out of the way, and so on. And it performs very well on a wide range of objects that it's never seen before. In fact, on a test set, consisting of difficult previously unseen objects, including small objects, large objects, soft objects, hard objects, and so on, it gets a success rate of 96%, which to my knowledge is basically the state of the art for grasping systems that have to grasp from monocular RGB images. Now, of course, this grasping system doesn't work all the time, so its understanding of the world is highly imperfect. But because it's trained with reinforcement learning, there's a very easy solution to this, which is to learn the job. So let's say that during training, you trained your Q function as a success rate of 96%, but then at test time, it's tasked with picking up some glass bottles that are very difficult to grasp, and it has a success rate of 49%. With an ordinary computer vision system, we would be in a lot of trouble at this point. We'd have to collect more labeled data and retrain the whole thing. But with reinforcement learning, there's a very easy solution, which is to just keep training, because this system can supervise itself. There's no human effort required for this. In fact, there's actually no reason to turn off the training when the system is deployed. Every grasp that it collects is additional training data. So to evaluate this, we conducted an extensive empirical investigation where we started with our 600,000 initial trials. And then for each variant of the scene, we collected initial, an additional 800 trials corresponding to about four hours of data to see how well the system could adapt. And you can see in this video, performance after adaptation for a range of different perturbations, grasping glass bottles that were very difficult for the uh, system to pick up initially, grasping objects under very harsh lighting, which drastically changed the appearance of the scene, grasping objects with a checkerboard in the background, with a different gripper, and with a highly modified offset gripper by 10 centimeters. In fact, most of the performance of this fine-tuning process was actually acquired after the first 400 uh, grasp attempts, which is about two hours of fine-tuning. Now, you might say that this is still not fully signaling an understanding of the scene because we're still testing this thing on its actual ability to grasp. So another thing that we've investigated, and this is uh, work that was led by Eric Jang and my student Colleen Devon, 
was whether we could actually acquire an understanding of object semantics, object identity, and object localization entirely through grasping. So this, this work is going to leverage a pretty simple insight, which is that if you grasp some object, like this blue bottle, that object must have been present in the scene before the grasp, and it must be absent in the scene after the grasp. We can leverage this idea by setting up a kind of arithmetic that we enforce on our representation. The representation of the scene before the grasp minus the representation after the grasp should be roughly equal to the representation of the object that was grasped. We can instantiate this like this. Let's take a convnet and use it to embed the scene to produce an embedding, and we'll embed both the pre-grasp scene and the post-grasp scene, and then take their difference. And then we'll say that this difference should be close to the embedding of the object that was grasped. And we'll use a contrastive loss to enforce a similarity so that the embedding of the same object is close to the difference, embeddings of other objects are far from the distance. Now, crucially, we're not going to use any ground truth knowledge of object identity. So if you picked up the blue bottle twice, you would actually repulse the second grasp from, uh, uh, from the difference in the first grasp. But because the negatives for this contrastive loss contain so many other images containing other objects, on average, it will actually repulse other objects more than it will repulse the same object. One of the things we can do with this representation is perform object-specific grasping. So you're going to see an image pop up on the screen. The robot is tasked with picking up the object corresponding to that image, but crucially, the object in the scene doesn't look the same. It might be from a different viewpoint. It might be oriented differently. So here the object is tasked with picking up a brush. The brush in the scene looks nothing like the brush in the image. And of course, after it's picked up, it doesn't look the same either. Uh, but, their objects to, but the robot still localizes it successfully. And crucially, these are test objects. These are not objects that the model was trained on. Besides picking up the correct object, the robot will also exhibit some interesting behavior to try to isolate that object from clutter. So occasionally, it uh, picks up a couple of things. But whenever it's able to, it'll actually move clutter out of the way in order to pick up just the right object. And this is very interesting because we didn't tell it to do this. This is emerging entirely from reinforcement learning and this contrastive objective. In fact, when we tested this system on its ability to pick up the right object on a test set of objects that were not seen during training, we found that our learned grasp to deck representation actually outperformed a model that was allowed access to true object labels during training. On the training objects, it performed about the same because the true labels contain a lot of information, but on test objects, it actually performed better. Furthermore, the representation learned by this system could actually give some pretty decent object localizations despite never having been trained for localization. So what you're seeing in the middle image is a heat map of the convolutional layers for the images on the bottom, trying to find the feature vectors in the conv layer that are most similar to the features of the object at the top. So it's essentially taking the dot product of the objects at the top with each location in the image at the bottom. And you can see that it actually picks up on the location of that object in the scene. So this means that simply through this contrast of loss NRL, the method was able to essentially learn to understand scenes well enough to localize objects. The next question we're going to ask is whether we can use reinforcement learning to learn to understand open world scenarios, not just grasping in a laboratory, but outdoor scenes that are not under our control. So in these experiments, which were uh, performed by my, by my student, Gregory Kahn. We trained this uh, jackal robot to navigate around its environment. Data was collected entirely autonomously through random navigation. And then the robot was trained to predict whether a given sequence of actions might result in a bumpy ride, or whether a given sequence of actions might result in a collision. And what you're seeing in the animations at the bottom are predictions for different candidate action sequences on the left from bumpiness and on the right for collision. And you can see that uh, in training this entirely self-supervised way, the robot is actually able to figure out bumpiness, so it's able to understand terrain properties, and it's able to understand the basics of geometry by being able to predict collisions. The training procedure for the system is pretty simple. We have a convolutional neural network with an LSTM layer in the middle. The LSTM reads in a sequence of candidate future actions, and then the model outputs a sequence of predictions about quantities of interest. So you can think of this as basically predicting candidate uh, reward sequences, candidate bumpiness and candidate collisions. Now, uh, one of the things we can try to understand is whether the system can then acquire some interesting navigational affordances. So here we're seeing our train system navigating a outdoor field, a grassy field. 
On the left is a baseline that uses the LiDAR mounted on the Jackal robot to try to understand the geometry of the scene and then navigate around that geometry. This baseline perceives the grass in the grassy field essentially as impa impassable obstacles, whereas our approach is able to correctly understand that grass is passable because it learned that through experience. So it learns a kind of navigational common sense uh, that some obstacles are traversable and some aren't. I think this is very interesting to point out because a conventional ge geometric approach that just tries to reconstruct the geometry would not be able to acquire this behavior. Similarly, when driving outdoors on different paths, this method was able to figure out that concrete paths avoid bumpiness whereas driving on the grass results in a more bumpy ride. All right, uh, now in the second half of this talk, let me talk a little bit about model-based methods. In contrast to the model-free methods I described before, the model-based methods attempt to actually predict the full sequence of future observations. So you could imagine that we have our robots, it's interactive with the world and collected a collection of uh, experience, which consists of states, actions, and next states, and then it's going to use this experience to learn to predict future states or future observations, and then occasionally collect more data to improve its performance. Once such a model has been trained, the robot can actually perform desired tasks uh, simply by taking as input the user's task specification and then trying out different action sequences through its internal model and selecting the action sequence that leads to the desired outcome. So what I'm going to discuss is work that was covered in a, in a number of papers, which are mentioned here on this slide. Uh, we need to first collect some data, and we're going to collect data essentially in much the same way that the children do by interacting with the world through play. So these robots are going to play with objects in their environment, randomly moving things around, collecting some experience, and then that experience will be used to train a predictive model, to train an understanding of the world. Here you can see some of the predictions from this predictive model. Uh, the two rows, each row shows predictions starting from the same initial image, but each column corresponds to a different action sequence. So you can see that for different action sequences, the robot's arm moves in different ways, and when that arm contacts objects, the objects also move in different ways. We can give the robot a task by selecting a point in the scene, indicated with a red uh, dot, and indicating to the robot where that point should go, indicated with a green dot. So we can ask what the robot predicts, and here it correctly predicts that the stapler should move to the right. The heat map at the bottom shows the predicted movement of that red point. And when we execute that in the world, the robot correctly reaches out, grabs a stapler, and moves it to the desired location. These tasks may seem simple, but it's important to remember that they're performed entirely from images, only using this end-to-end -end model without any additional geometric knowledge or knowledge of objects. But perhaps more interestingly, we can actually then use the models like this to examine the robot's understanding of the world. One of the things we can try to do is we can see if the robot can learn automatically to use tools. So here, we're going to give the robot a task, which is to move these two objects, and there's a tool position in the image, and the robot is going to have to figure out that it has to pick up the tool and use it to slide both objects together, and then perform that in the environment. So in the middle, you can see the prediction. On the right, you can see the actual execution. To train such a model, we basically train the predictive model just like before with one modification. We need to actually be, uh, ensure that the robot can understand that tools exist and they can be used to move objects. So in addition to random data collection, we're also going to provide the robot with some number of demonstrations. Crucially, these demonstrations are not demonstrating the task that the robot will be asked to do at test time. It's still up to the robot to figure out how to do the task. The demonstrations are just showing that usage of tools is something that exists in the world and something that is available for it to use, but it's, it'll have to figure out on its own how to actually use it. And then at test time, we'll actually use uh, a derivative free planning algorithm based on the cross-entropy method to plan through this model to perform the task. So here are a few examples of tool use tasks that this model could perform. Here we told the robot to move two objects down from the plate, and the robot figured out they could pick up the sponge and use a sponge to move these objects. Here we told the robot to move this blue object to the upper part of the bin, but we disallowed it from moving the gripper to reach out for the blue object. So the robot had to figure out on its own that it had to actually use this tool to move the blue object, so it's not permitted to move outside of the green zone, and the robot was able to do this successfully. Here we have kind of an improvised tool use task. So uh, the students left some of their junk out on the table along the bottle, and we asked it to move two pieces of garbage off to the side to clean up, and the robot figured out that it could pick up the bottle and use the bottle to sweep the garbage. And this is work that was done by uh, Annie Shi, who's a student with Chelsea Finn, and Frederick Ebert, who's uh, co-advised by myself and Chelsea. 
One thing we also wanted to make sure of is that this model could actually figure out that in some cases tools should be used and in some cases they shouldn't. So here we set up a task where the robot has to move two objects and was able to correctly figure out that it needs to use the tool to move both of these objects. But next we set up a task where there was only one object that needed to be moved. And here it's actually much quicker for the robot to simply move the single object. And that's in fact exactly what it does. So this shows that it's not simply copying tool use behavior it's seen before. It's really looking at the scene, trying to understand what sequence of actions will result, result in the desired outcome most efficiently, and then performing that sequence of actions. All right, so to conclude and summarize, I discussed an embodied learning recipe for scene understanding, a recipe where you can have an agent that interacts with the world, performs some tasks end to end, and these are primarily prediction tasks, predicting rewards and predicting future observations. And based on those tasks, actually acquires a representation of the environment that reflects some degree of understanding. And I talked about how we can probe this uh, representation in various ways. For example, I discussed how we can learn behaviors from large amounts of uh, interaction for things like grasping, and then have things like understanding of object position or even object identity emerge from these grasping skills. I talked about how we could train predictive models for collision and bumpiness and have robots that understand navigational affordances, like for example, the fact that driving on concrete paths results in a less bumpy ride, or that grass in a grassy field does not constitute an impassable obstacle, whereas a wall does. And then I also talked about how building predictive models and training those predictive models end to end could result in robots that have some understanding of their environment to the point where they could uh, use tools, reposition objects, and correctly understand situations where tool use is called for and situations where it isn't. Uh, I'd like to thank the students that were involved in this work, uh, and I'd like to also thank all of you for listening. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions during the question period. Yep, thank you. All right, so I think I, I got a few of the questions on the chat, but if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to take those uh, verbally. So do we have any um, verbal uh, questions? You can just click on the raise hand button and then yeah, you can have this. So there's one in the chat. That. Can you please comment on the criticism of RL due to a large number of trials? There are some comments in this workshop about sample size. This is a very good question. And I'm glad you asked that. So, um, and, this, and this is something that comes up a lot because uh, you know we, um, uh, we see, for example, some results that um, are produced in simulation, like for example, um, you know, like AlphaGo required several billion games of Go to learn a policy. I think it's important to remember that um, when people set up RL experiments in simulation, they're not really optimized for efficiency. So that's why you'll, you'll read like, you know, papers that say, oh, we required like a billion trials. If you actually set this stuff up in a way that uses the most efficient recent algorithms and actually optimize things for efficiency, it's not that bad. And there are two sources of sample complexity and they're kind of separate. One source is exploration. So if you need to do lots of random trials to just succeed at the task before you can learn anything, that's going to uh, result in a lot of sample complexity. But that has very little to do with generalization or learning. It's really about like discovering a good outcome. Um, if you have data that's uh, reasonably good, like we did in the grasping project, generally what we found is that generalization in RL is not really any less efficient than, than in any other domain. So you know, for grasping, we needed several million images to generalize. ImageNet requires several million images to generalize for object recognition. So it seems like the, you know, from my experience, the numbers are on the same order of magnitude with the caveat that exploration is important to keep track of. And if you have a really difficult exploration problem, then you'll need many more trials. Yeah, I think we have one more minute for any free questions. Uh, hi, uh, so Jay, actually I have one, one extra question. So this morning, uh, David Forsyth, he gave an opening remark and in his remark, he says that he's also in support of the like uh, in-place representations for task-oriented uh, vision. But he, his opinion is that uh, the reinforced learning will not be a final solution to these problems. So I think one of the evidence he mentioned is that it's against uh, some natural uh, mechanisms of uh, 
certain biological an animals. So, but in current like AI, we use uh, RL to get some very good uh, results or performances. But like, how do you envision the past and what's the relationship with uh, our current natures of how how we plan and how we uh, like perceive the three D world? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that there's sort of um, I don't know. Maybe it's worthwhile for us to kind of separate the question of whether you can get implicit representations from end-to-end -end training from whether you should. Like the, the same the same argument could be applied, for example, to object classification. You could say, well, yeah, you can train classifiers end-to-end, -end, but maybe you'll do better if you use lots of unlabeled data and learn representations. I think something like that could definitely hold true for the stuff that I discussed as well. I think. Uh, rather than arguing that point, which is really kind of a much more subtle thing, my main goal was just to uh, attempt to demonstrate that you can get implicit representations from just learning skills. You could, you could perhaps get better representations if you also do some explicit representation learning. I don't, I don't think that's out of the question. There's one more question. Uh, can you please comment on the criticism that it's very hard to tune and, des and design uh, reward functions in RL? Uh, that's... Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, and this is like, you know, for those of you that are not familiar with it, this is maybe like one of the biggest tragedies of reinforcement learning is that we, we claim that our, in RL, you simply specify what you want and not how you want to do it. But in reality, when we program these reward functions, we stuff lots of knowledge in there and just kind of don't tell anybody about it. Um, it would be very nice to have a better solution for this. Uh, one of the things that we've been exploring uh, a lot in some of the research in my group is to actually define reward functions automatically uh, using other computer vision models. So you basically train a classifier that defines your reward function, and then you train a policy that sort of makes that classifier uh, output the success label. Um, and we've gotten some traction on that, and it seems to be kind of working. Uh, but it's definitely an open area, and I think there's a lot more research that's needed uh, in that area. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk, and thank you for the Q&A session. So if you have more questions, feel free to use the chat room. And if Professor Sergey, let me you have more time, you can also use the chat room to discuss. Yeah. So then next, let's move to our next talk by Professor Kristen Gorman from University of Texas at Austin. Kristen is also a research scientist in Facebook AI research, and her research focuses on visual recognition and search. She's a recipient of Homeholds Prize and also a lot of famous, uh, a, lot, a lot of interesting and famous prize. Yeah. Okay. Also, the Pami Young researcher at work, et cetera, yeah. Okay, thank you, and that's welcome, Kristen. No, I think you're muted. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes. Hang on, let's see. So we, we can hear you now. Now you can hear me. Okay, good, good. Glad I checked, thank you. So, hi, it's great to be part of this workshop. Thank you so much for having me here. This talk is about people watching for agent learning, where we want to be able to learn from images and video, and in particular, egocentric video. So to motivate how do embodied agents learn today? Well, a lot of experience often in terms of trying different actions and seeing their results. Also from people, from demonstrations that might be kinesthetic demonstrations to show a robot the states and actions it should but in sequence to achieve a given goal. Certainly, there's also a great deal of perception and vision is used quite heavily and we saw some great examples just in this last talk. Um, but the vision is often for the purpose of sensing and measuring what's around the agent. But what if we turn that sensing towards action in terms of looking at how people do things? So here I'm showing you an egocentric video. It's from a head-mounted camera on a person. And we see that people can teach us a whole lot of things from such observations, like how they move in the environment, how they direct their attention over time, how they interact with other people, and how they interact with objects, whether that's um, touching them, grasping them, or using them for some task. So all these kinds of things are certainly embedded in visual data, like I'm showing you here in this egocentric video. And the theme of this talk and some of our ongoing work is how to push from that kind of information into the way we influence the behaviors of robots and embodied agents, whether for manipulation or navigation or in applications in augmented reality. 
Okay, so that's the theme of this talk, people watching for agent learning. We're trying to move towards intelligent embodied agents that learn by watching people interact. And in particular, I'll talk about three modes of interaction that we wanna capture from images and video. That's the environment, objects, and people. Okay, so I'm gonna start right by looking at environments. Let me set the stage a bit further, contrasting what we get from egocentric video from videos like you see here, which are traditional so-called third-person videos. And third-person data, we're a spectator. We see the world in front of us. And there's a lot of what, where questions of interest, like what is that object? Where's the person? What is he doing? But when you turn instead to egocentric video, we get a different set of questions because here we're seeing the world through the eyes of a person engaged with the environment. So these things are strongly linked, the person and the space they're in. And so this leads to questions that are more like what if or how, such as, you know, what will this person do next? Or what are the areas important for an activity? How to use a space? How to use a given object? So if I think in these terms then, and we think about the question of mapping an environment, like here I'm showing you some top-down view of a 3D environment, the question is how to map it. And we know that traditionally this could be tackled with metric maps, say produced by SLAM, whether in 3D or in 2D, as shown in this occupancy map here. But what we wanna propose now is, especially in the context of egocentric video, to think about mapping a space by its functionality. And in particular, to map it by its human-centric functionality, such that we can learn by how you humans are using a space. And I think that egocentric video gives us such a great um, medium for doing this. So I'm gonna introduce this idea, Egotopo, um, which we are presenting at the main conference this week. And the idea is rather than think of video as a stack of frames, something that you would push through a 3D convolutional network, instead we'll think of these egocentric videos as topological graphs that are grounded in how people use the space. So from an ego video, we're going to extract a series of nodes connected with some um, proximity relationships in time. Each of these nodes is going to be coherent in terms of the activities that are done by people at that place. Okay, so think of a graph over an entire kitchen and a node is some, say, workstation or place that certain activities take place in that environment. This is what we're after, and in coding like this, and in, in what follows, I'm gonna tell you how we get it and why it's useful and can bring us towards um, helping embodied agents. So this will define the, the, the video now, not as frames, but as how humans use the space. And there's two ways that we're going to try and leverage this topological graph, ego topo. First, to reason about first person behavior. So for example, these, might re these graphs can reveal that the people tended to go from the fridge with the vegetable to wash it and then cut it at this cutting board. And secondly, in terms of environment affordances, because with this encoding explicitly centered around use of a space, we can start to have a record and an anticipation for what actions are gonna be possible where. And both these things are, we, we can translate into help embodied agents. This is the goal. So let me say then more about how this graph is computed. First, we want to have a way to decide if frames or clips go together. So we train a localization network that will pay attention to normal things like visual similarity or the geometric consistency between frames, but also will pay attention to human-centered properties, like the fact that the person moved from A to B very quickly tells us something about the link in A and B, as well as if we can measure related distributions of actions observed and objects observed in these um, two locations, two frames. Okay, so this network will allow us to group or ungroup any part of the egocentric video. So we'll use that localization network then to pass through sequentially an egocentric video. And as we see new frames that don't belong or aren't localized with any of the existing nodes in our topological graph, we will create a new node, and as we see frames that do, we'll augment the existing node. And keep in mind that this graph is a record of these spaces and their proximity, as well as the visits, meaning the video clips associated with each of them over the long video. 
Okay, so I'm showing you one such graph being dynamically created from the video on the right at Fast Forward. This is a video from the Epic Kitchens data set of unscripted kitchen activities. And you can see how, you know, in these nodes, the different places that which activities were done were, were sorted out and with them stored the activities that took place in the form of the raw video. All right, so now let me say about something about those two tasks or those ways in which we're gonna leverage this ego topo representation. The first is anticipation of action. So rather than saying what's happening right now in the video, we're also quite interested in knowing what's gonna happen, what will the person do in the future, conditioned on what we've seen so far. And current methods have been starting to look at this task, however, in a very instantaneous way, for example, trying to predict the next second's worth of activity. And in this work, we've been trying to push further into a long form video where the future actions that we need to predict may span five to 45 minutes worth of content. Okay, so this will be the task then to predict all the future actions given the first K percent and we'll sweep through that value K in evaluation. Now to get this, we need to add a bit to the ego topo as I've already so far defined it. And what we do is now express um, or encode each of the the video nodes in the ego topo graph with an encoder that's going to be learned for this task. And among all those nodes, then we also use a graph convolutional net network to represent their, their topology. From this GCN, then we're training a classifier to perform action anticipation. Here are some results looking at two data sets. Epic is on the left, the kitchen data set I've been showing you. And then the one on the right is from Georgia Tech, um, also containing kitchens. And these are accuracy rates. We want them to be higher. And I'm showing you comparisons with on the top three rows, what we call pure video methods, methods that look at 3D convolution, say across the stack of frames. And then below those are other methods that try to incorporate more structure into the video encoding. And you can see that there's some promising results here for using the ego topo, um, giving us good bumps for um, especially these epic challenging epic kitchens for anticipation. Okay, so that was the first task I wanted to touch on with Ego Topo. The other is environment affordances. And here the question is not just, you know, what do I see happening here, but what could I do here? And you can start to think, you know, why this is something we want our embodied and mobile agents to be able to do as they encounter a new environment and think about the actions that are possible. So if you just observe the video, you'll know what the person did there. And in this case, you know, they turned on the stove, say. But there's so many other things that belong as affordances for this space. So how we can use EgoTopo to learn those better. Our idea here is to augment what I've told you so far, to think not just of a graph per kitchen or a graph per environment, but to think of a consolidated graph in which we can link nodes from one environment to another. Okay, so kitchen one on the top, kitchen one on the bottom, we wanna link the nodes according to their functionality. We do this based on looking at the distribution of objects or activities that are observed in either place. So what does this do for you? Well, now you have not observed all the N actions at a given clip of video and a given node, but you can pool those um, activities observed across the linked nodes in this consolidated graph over multiple environments. And you, we treat this as a way to propagate labels across the, um, the videos so that we can now train a stronger environment affordance model. So this will give you predictions like um, we're, we're showing in um, visual form here, where the ego topo graph is as input, and then we're training a model to predict these anticipated affordances for the environment. And for example, on the right, looking at frames like these, the system was saying that it's rather likely to see something like filling a cup or pouring water here, but more unlikely to see, for example, taking oil in green. Okay, so we've tested then the accuracy of those such predictions. Again, same two data sets I showed you before. And this time we're interested in baselines that do other means of propagating labels. For example, in a pure 3D sense, what if you take the SLAM reconstruction and then for any activity that happened in a grid cell in that space, you pull the labels or if you do the same with visual similarity. And again, we're seeing some encouraging results um, for trying to tackle this and getting more accurate affordance predictions. 
So this is Ego Topo, and um, here I'm showing you a visualization of another one of these Ego Topo graphs being computed, and then the affordances that are learned associated with each part of the space. And the main message here of this approach is to move from thinking of video, and particularly egocentric video, as a stack of frames and a volume of data, but instead to think of it as grounded in a persistent physical space in which the portions of that space are really dictated by human use. So this was how we're people watching. Now let's turn this general kind of idea towards how we can benefit the embodied agents. And in our ongoing work, we've been looking at a problem of interaction and exploration. This is where we would like an agent to enter an unfamiliar environment, like the one I'm showing here from AI Thor, and attempt unfamiliar actions so that it starts to learn what its different high-level actions do, where they succeed, where they fail. And the idea then that we have is to translate visual affordances, and as depicted on the right with these color codings, that the agent can predict in order to guide its behavior in this environment towards more frequently the successful interactions. So we have implemented this in AI Thor, and I'm showing you the agent's view on the left and the top-down view of the agent on the right. And the left view has color codings according to a visual affordance model predictions. For example, green is placeable, blue is toggleable. And these aren't ground truth, these are what the agent's predicting. And what our method would do here is learn a policy that's rewarding the agent for getting more and more exposure to more correct interactions. And our model will do this with the added benefit of having people watched or don't had experience with these objects so that the visual affordance guides it to the useful hotspots in the place. So on the right in the top down view, green dots are success places where it tried to do an action, maybe it tried to cut bread and it worked. And the yellow ones are failure actions where, for example, maybe it walked up and tried to cut a bowl and that didn't work. And so the whole mission here is to have an agent that comes into the new space, collects a lot more of those green instances than the yellow ones because it's efficient about inferring where its different actions may work in this new space. So in the remainder of my time, I'll talk more briefly about these other angles of interaction in which where we want to people watch objects, now, and then people. So in objects, this, there's an analogous um, setting here that we're interested in. Now I'm jumping from the level of environments down to objects, where rather than simply being able to name what we're looking at, we want to be able to have systems that see what it is in terms of the actions it affords. And this I mean you know, to the level of where would I grasp it in order to pick it up, where would I touch it in order to toggle it, and so on. Now, the way you would do this today um, in, a, in a visual based way is heavily supervised. So there are current models that would treat this as a semantic segmentation problem where you have visual inputs uh, that have been labeled by hand to say where different actions are possible. Like here's everywhere I could hold a book. And the concern here is not just that this could be expensive to supervise, but it also has this kind of gap between what an annotator thinks is important for holding this book and how a person actually holds a book. And in fact, there's many ways in which we can hold and use a book and other objects. So our idea is to, again, learn by people watching. And we're going to learn models from video, egocentric, or third person about how people are using objects, and then allow that to inform our agent. So let me say a bit about this approach, which we call interaction hotspots. And this is work we presented recently at ICCV, where you have at training time weekly labeled data for actions. So you have some videos where you know there's an open action happening or a press action happening and so on for each verb. Now, starting from that model, we're going to also inject um, a, a network here that needs to be able to take an image of an object at rest and anticipate the latent space features for, or the learned features for that object undergoing a given interaction. Okay, so in other words, you wanna be able to look at the microwave on the left when it's closed and anticipate how it would look if it were open. And we're gonna do this by training this recognition model together with this anticipation network to, to achieve this matching. Having done that, now in order to say, well, where in that microwave or refrigerator what regions are responsible for this possible affordance? 
we'll use class activation mapping through this same network in order to go back and find those spatial regions that were most responsible for the given verbs label. Of course, this is the anticipated verbs label. So for example, here, going back, we would say, well, here we could discover these are the hotspots for being pullable on this refrigerator or for some uh, any other end verbs, here's the hotspots for it's, where it's pressable. Okay, so we've got then a model, learn from video, doing people watching that now can look at new instances of objects, even new categories, and anticipate the regions where people would use them for any number of different actions. We've tested this with two data sets, Oprah, which is a Stanford data set from YouTube on the left, and Epic Kitchens, which I've already mentioned here on the right. And when we test, we're interest, very much interested in generalization, even to unseen categories. Because you want an agent that could come and experience a new space with a new device, a new appliance, and still have in it some anticipation of how it could be used or where it would be touched. Let me show you some of these qualitative results first. Here's some videos where we're just laying the hot spots that we computed over in color. And so green means mixable in this case, and the bowl looked mixable, mixable before someone mixed it, so did that pot. And I'm showing you five of these affordances at the bottom out of tens of these affordances in the model. These are just the most frequent ones in the data set. Here's another such case. The pink means washable, so that that one's washable, but so is the one to the left that's yet to be washed. And the, another example here on the top right, those jars looked openable, shown by that cyan blob, same with that door before the person reached for it. And final example on the left, this is just um, saliency in yellow and our method again on the right. And I wanted to highlight this difference between what you get from saliency or um, which would say, where are the interesting regions of the photos? And on the right, where we're really seeing the world through the eyes of how a human could use it. And this is the power of the egocentric video and um, the first step towards learning this directly from the ego video to get these affordances. Okay, and if we then kind of quantify how good are these hotspots, um, we're looking at how good are the heat maps against some ground truth. And when you compare against other weakly supervised methods, ours is coming out quite well, and even starting to compete with some that are very heavily supervised with these manual annotations. Okay, so this gives us some a way to start learning from egocentric video about how people do things. And now I wanna show you where we're going in current work with bringing this kind of visual affordance mapping to a robotic agent, and in this case, a dexterous hand. So we're interested in the dexterous hand. We're also challenged by it because of the high degree of freedom, um, 30 in this case for this robotic hand. And so there's great pressure certainly to accelerate the learning. And we think the visual affordances can do this for us. And so what we've been looking at is this premise, you know, how people use things can potentially directly relate to this dexterous hand given the similarity in the morphology of the agents. And furthermore, objects are made for human hands in some cases. So take these ideas of visual affordances now, and what we do is say, the agent should look at these objects, anticipate how a person would use it, and then we'll reward the agent for tr trying to explore those parts of the object first when training a policy with deep RL to lift these things off the table. And in short, what we're finding is that we can get the faster learning and more successful grasping and most importantly, we can offer some generalization ability to new objects. And this power comes from the fact that this is a visual model, image-based, and um, that means you can compute these affordance regions for objects, images that you haven't seen before. And we can contrast this with um, the challenge of learning from direct demonstrations, which instead would provide states and actions over time to instruct the robot, um, which also would would face potential challenges for generalizing to kind of objects for which we didn't have the proper states or action. And so I'm gonna show you a fly through of the training process first. So this is our agent starting to learn how to pick up six of the objects. And we've tested with about 25 to 30 of them. And here are about 800 iterations in, we're starting to get a little bit better progress, starting to look towards those regions that would be graspable based on human visual affordance models. And furthermore, starting to pick on 
those places that would lead to a functional grasp, such that the object could be used, not just uh, removed from the table. And then here are some results where we're showing the trained policies run on some um, new objects. And I'm showing you baselines, like on the top left, where there's no prior about where to grab, you're just getting rewarded for getting it off the table. On the top right, where you get rewarded for grabbing near the center of mass of the object. And then on the bottom right, ours, which we call graph for grasp affordances, which is also pure RL, just like the top two, but has this added visual affordance within it. And then the bottom left, which is a, a RL augmented with imitation learning from direct demonstration. Okay, so you can see some of the behavior differences in terms of the success in grasping as well as where these objects get grasped. All right, so I've shown you environments, objects, learning from people by watching them, particularly in egocentric video. Now in the very last couple of minutes, I'll talk about people. Okay, so these watching people interact, how does that help us in these models? And here we're interested in body pose. And in fact, we're interested in the body pose of the person who's wearing the camera. I'm showing you here an egocentric video captured on a chest-mounted camera from a person. And our goal is to know what is their 3D body pose. This is pretty interesting because most of the time you're not going to see the body itself. But we've shown in some of our earlier work that you can still infer this because of the structure and the way the camera moves and how the environment around changes when you do different things with your articulated body. And those are some of our initial results on the right. What's new and what we're presenting this week at CVPR as well is to consider interactions with another person. So I'll call this the second person, the person that you, the camera wearer, is interacting with. And we know from um, our own behavior as well as um, cognitive science that there's reasons to interchange our, our body postures in, in the connection with the um, the interperson interaction. For example, if I look, if you look at these photos, I imagine that even without seeing the people hidden by my boxes, you still have an expectation about what how they might be posed. And that's because you can see how the other people are posed, and the person, say on the left, might be reaching to hold to hold the hand of the person on the right. And this is the kind of thing we propose to leverage in our you to me ego pose model. We'll take the observed second person pose from the video captured in this egocentric view and learn those interaction dynamics such that it improves our ability to estimate the first person pose, the one that's hidden and behind the camera. So when we do this with ego video like you see on the left, um, remember this person is not the pose we want, ultimately we want the pose of the person behind the camera. And I'm showing you the ground truth as captured with a connect sensor in this case, pointed at the camera where, and our, our prediction on the right. And you can see that because there's this interchange, whether it's in a game, as some of these are showing, or if it's more conversational situation with gestures, then these poses are linked, we've learned how they link, and now we can infer um, the ego pose. And so I'm not showing all the quantitative results, um, point you to the paper if you're interested to see um, the impact of this compared to other things we might do. Okay, so I am going to close here. To recap, I've been talking about our newest results for people watching for the sake of agent learning. I showed environment affordances being discovered from egocentric video. Then I talked about moving down to the objects level and learning affordance hotspots from egocentric video. And then we tried to translate these ideas towards embodied agents, for example, for dexterous grasping and for interaction exploration and 3D environments. And then finally, I, I briefly highlighted this ego body pose estimation task and the value we're getting out of modeling other people in the ego video. This is work with everyone you see here, Tichar, Yang Hao, Christoph, Bianca, Yvonne, Gong Lai, and Hamuel. So I'm going to stop here and would be really glad to have any comments or questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kirsten. Very nice talk. I think we now have four questions in the chat room. <laughs> so you may just, though we have kind of few we can have like two to three minutes to address those comments. And if you have more time, maybe you can just directly chat them in the chat room. Okay, did you want me to read the chat or will you, are you re planning to read? Uh, you can read the chat based on your preference. Yeah. Okay, I'll, let me see. Um, yeah, so 
the the simulator, yes, the the robot simulator we're using is the adroit simulator for a 30 degree of freedom hand um, in Majoko. And transferring to real world settings is a great question and not one we've tackled yet. Um, it will be great to see, you know, not, not just going from the real world video to the simulated robot, but now out to the real robot, which isn't something we've attempted, but we'd love to. Um, trying to scroll up. Okay. Learning affordances from videos without any annotations. Yeah, I think this is an interesting step to take, say with the hotspots work, which as you recall, required weak supervision um, in terms of labels of knowing these actions. But we have kind of mused about a more unsupervised version that could, for example, discover the actions that the humans are doing and then do something similar to what I described. Um, I don't think this is trivial, but I think it's definitely another natural step to relax further the amount of annotator intervention in terms of learning these affordance models. Um, are the categories of the common spaces manually chosen? No, these are um, emerging organically from the video. So the local, in the first part of the talk, I talked about Ego Topo, and these spaces within the environment are discovered based on um, those, uh, the localization network looking for visual and metric similarity, but also the use by the human being their, their time um, proximity to a given place, as well as the distribution of actions and objects that were observed there. So there's no an manual intervention to set these. Okay. Um, these questions might be from Sergey, but I think I've gotten to maybe all this one here. Yeah, I think. Yes, we got them. Yeah, I think we got them. So if you, if the participants have more questions, feel free to use the chat room to share and then discuss. So there's uh, one more question, I think. Yeah, yeah. One more, just just came. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let me find the window. That's how do we resolve ambiguities in the affordance? For example, an object can be used for multiple purposes. That's right. Yeah, and there's a the. The hotspots model accounts for this in the sense that we have an array of verbs and a, you can think of it as a multi-label application. So for any given frame, you remember those different colors, it means at, even at a given spot an object, there might be possibility for multiple different affordances or purposes. Um, whereas once we've taken it to the grasping, right now the, we're, with the robot, we're focused on grasping specifically, which is like one of those verbs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kristen. And also, right. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Then it comes to our last speaker, um, Professor Daniel Ricci from Brown University. Uh, so, Professor Daniel Ricci co-leads the Brown Visual Computing Group. His research is funded by gifts from Adobe, Pixar, and Nvidia, as well as grants from DARPA and the National Science Foundation, including NSF Career Award. So, let's welcome um, Daniel to give us the talk. Wow, thanks. I didn't realize I had the honor of being the last presenter today. <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen.